Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I am excited today because we have book three in the Harborview series and I can't wait to share Margaret's story with you. Margaret is our local hat maker. She is a doll. Her heart was broken by William who is a scoundrel and she has a hard time trusting herself and her intuition when it comes to love even though she's met a wonderful police officer named Benjamin O'Malley. There are some housekeeping things that we need to cover. So first one, is back in the first audiobook from this series in Harborview number one. We had the situation with Captain Jack's name, and I told you that I would come up with a new name for Captain Jack, and I have. It's gone through several revisions as I was writing. I would try out a name and be like, mm, that just doesn't work. So the name that I finally came settled on was Captain Nathan. So Captain Nathan will be in this one. He's Captain Jack from the first one. In these videos, you get to see the evolution of it. I haven't released them yet in print book form or ebook form. Hopefully sometime this week, maybe next week, they'll be available on Amazon and you can find them. Um, we need to talk about that in just a second. So Captain Jack is now Captain Nathan. The other name that changes from the first book is the name on the front cover. Now I changed the thumbnail to match. So it says Lucille, but um, if you're actually watching the video, instead of just listening to it, you'll see that on that book cover, it says Olivia McConnell, which is a name I adore. So I was choosing a pen name for this series, which I did. Side note, when um, authors switch genres, which this is a genre switch from my normal contemporary rom-coms and cowboy romances, they oftentimes use a pen name to differentiate between the two genres. And I always tell my fellow authors that they should um, use a name or a variation of their name so that their current readers will see that there's a connection and it's easier for them to find these other genres. Because honestly, readers read a lot of different genres, but if they do and they want to find one from an author they already know, seeing Lucille McConnell on a cover would be like, huh, I wonder if this is Lucy McConnell, which it is. I switched for books two and three to say Lucille McConnell on the cover. And when I put them in print form, they will be from Lucille McConnell. And Lucille McConnell will be my pen name for all of my historical romance fiction. So that's another change that you probably have seen. You'll also notice that these books are written from first person and only one point of view. When Lucy McConnell writes a book, she writes from third person and from both points of view, the male and the female. I may change that with Lucille. I may allow her. That sounds really weird because it's like I'm talking about her like she's not me. I may write from both points of view at some point in time. Um, but for right now, I'm really enjoying just sticking in the woman's point of view and showing things that are happening on the guy's side from her perspective. That's a lot of fun. So I'm going to keep with that for the Harbor View series and we'll see where it goes from there. Um, the other thing you're going to notice when I put them in print is that the covers are going to change um, my plan. Like I'm going to say that now. My plan now is to do women in the period dresses on the front with the background of Boston slash Harbor View behind them. So, so if you go over to Amazon to get a print or an ebook version of this book, you'll notice that the cover is different. It is the same book. Just look for the Lucille McConnell on the front and it'll be there. Okay. That was a lot to cover. So let's jump in to Harbor View and to Margaret and Benjamin's love story. And when we get back, I'll have a couple more things to cover about what's coming up in this series. And then, yeah, we'll see you on the flip side. Chapter One The delicate chime of the bell above my family's hat shop, Sullivan's Fine Hats, barely registered as I arranged a new display of imported silk ribbons, their vibrant hues a striking contrast against the weathered oak shelves. Wisps of chestnut hair escaped my bun, tickling the nape of my neck as I meticulously placed each spool. The earthy scent of aging wood mingled with the soft perfume of freshly starched linen and the tinge of sea salt that always hung over our fair city, enveloped me in a familiar cocoon of comfort. Beyond the window, the cobblestone streets of Harborview bustled with life, the air electric with excitement. Gentlemen in frock coats hurried to their offices, while ladies in sweeping skirts, promenade with parasols, held aloft. I scrutinized their clothing and hats, noting several of my own design and admiring some that had been ordered from overseas. The city was abuzz with preparations for the grand celebrations, marking the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. 
We had dozens of orders for hats draped in red, white, and blue and worked on them constantly to keep up with demand. I paused to adjust my skirts, the rich rustle of the fabric a testament to the latest fashions. The Polonese overskirt draped elegantly over the bustled underskirt, the deep green hue complementing my ivory shirtwaist. It was a far cry from the simple frocks of my youth, but I had learned to embrace the ever-changing trends to keep up with my customers. My mind wandered to the other changes sweeping through Harborview. Just last week, the police department had installed a series of call boxes throughout the city, a marvel of modern technology. The tall, blue boxes, each marked with a police badge emblem, allowed citizens to summon an officer at a moment's notice. It was a comforting thought, knowing help was never far away and a strange world to live in. It seemed new inventions happened every day and great minds worked long hours. The call boxes were just one of the many improvements I had witnessed in my 25 years. From the horse-drawn streetcars that clattered past my shop to the new sewer system that kept our streets clean, Harborview was a city on the rise. And as a daughter of this city, I couldn't help but feel a swell of pride at how far we had come since the humble days of the revolution. With a contented sigh, I stepped back to admire my handiwork. The ribbons gleamed like jewels in the sunlight, a rainbow of promise waiting to adorn the hats of Harborview's finest ladies. It was a small part to play in the grand tapestry of our city, but it was one I cherished nonetheless. As I turned back to the counter, ready to greet customers, I couldn't help but feel a flicker of anticipation. For in a city on the brink of greatness, anything seemed possible. And who knew what surprises the centennial year might hold? Margaret, called Elena, my younger sister. The new velvet from Paris has arrived. She could barely hold back her excitement and I would have joined her in a round of squeals and hopping up and down if it weren't for the customers in our store. Velvet from Paris, the pinnacle of fashion for the discerning ladies of Harborview. With measured steps, I crossed the creaking floorboards to inspect the newly arrived treasure. Exquisite, I breathed, trailing a reverent hand over the sumptuous fabric. Elena beamed at my approval, her cornflower blue eyes sparkling with shared enthusiasm. In this sanctuary of elegance and artistry, we were more than just sisters, we were kindred spirits, united in our love for all frippery. Growing up, Elena and I had been inseparable, two peas in a pod, as mother always said. While our older sisters Emily and Charlotte had been content with their dolls and tea parties Elena and I could be found in the supply room dreaming up fantastical designs and playing at being grand ladies of fashion. Though Emily and Charlotte had long since married and started families of their own Elena and I remained devoted to the family business. My single status wasn't as much a choice as it was a matter of circumstances beyond my control. My heart squeezed as I remembered the darkest period of my life, just over a year ago. The man I had loved with all my heart, the one I had thought I would marry and spend the rest of my days with, had left me shattered and alone. I was lost, adrift in a sea of grief and betrayal, unable to imagine a future without him. Elena was my rock, my guiding light through the storm. She had held me as I cried, listened to my anguished outpourings without judgment, and gently reminded me of my own strength when I had forgotten it. With her unwavering support and love, I had slowly begun to heal, to piece myself back together and rediscover the joy in life. What would you say to using this for the Winthrop wedding? Elena asked, holding up a length of ivory lace and bringing me back to the conversation. I think it would be stunning with that silk taffeta they insist upon. Mother hovered nearby, listening, but not interrupting. She had long ago learned that we loved discussing the fabrics and such as much as we enjoyed actually bringing our ideas to life. She grinned in encouragement and went to talk to Mrs. Dickens about her choice of dried flowers. I nodded, my mind already racing with possibilities. And perhaps a touch of pearl embellishment along the brim? To catch the light as the bride walks down the aisle? Elena's grin widened, her eyes dancing with excitement. Margaret, you're a genius. That would be absolutely perfect. We lost ourselves in familiar work and easy banter. Being in the shop was just like being at home. There was no reason to wish a moment of time here away. The peaceful hum of customers chatting was shattered by Elena's cry. Stop! Thief! Her slight frame quivered with indignation as she pointed an accusing finger at a man in a dark coat. He had stuffed handfuls of ribbons into his pockets, their ends dangling down to his thigh. His darting eyes and nervous movements sent my heart racing. I moved to intercept him, my pulse pounding a staccato rhythm against my ribs. My tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth in shock and fear. 
Nevertheless, I had to press forward to stop him from stealing from my family. My father died not long after opening the shop. As a group of women, we were, at times, considered an easy target for pickpockets. It infuriated me enough to get my feet moving. How dare he? As I approached, he took a menacing step towards me, his hand reaching into his coat pocket that hung heavily, as if he carried a gun. The sour stench of unwashed clothes assaulted my nostrils, making my stomach churn. Stay back, he snarled, his voice rough and ragged, like gravel grating against stone. I'm warning you, miss. Don't try to be a hero. I froze, my blood turning to ice in my veins. The man's gaunt face twisted with a mixture of fear and anger, and I realized, with a sinking feeling that he was capable of anything in his desperation. The bitter taste of fear coated my tongue, and a cold sweat broke out along my hairline. All this for ribbons? He stepped again and the pocket jingled. Change. Money. He was too far from our cash box to have stolen it from us. The front door banged open making us all jump. Elena squeaked like a mouse under a shoe. A customer screamed, her hand going to her forehead as if she would faint. I turned to see a police officer rush in from the street, his tall frame cutting an imposing figure as he ran straight towards the thief. In his haste, he accidentally clipped a display of delicate lace gloves, sending them fluttering to the floor in a snowy cascade. I didn't have time to lament over them as everything happened so fast. The thief made a desperate attempt to dodge around the policeman. Yanking his hand out of his coat pocket, he shoved past a startled customer, sending her stumbling into a rack of parasols that toppled with a clatter. The officer was too quick to be fooled or thrown off his target. He threw himself at the man, tackling him to the ground. They began to tossle. The thief rolled over Nad threw a fist up. His knuckles grazed the officer's temple. I gasped, clutching my hands to my own face in horror. The officer dropped his knee into the man's stomach and then quickly rolled him onto his face where he put the same knee into his back to keep him there. The thief gave up the fight. One strong hand gripped the thief's collar while the other deftly retrieved the stolen ribbons from his pockets. Coins clattered to the floor. The officer's expression was grim, his jaw set with determination. You've been busy today. The man turned his head the other direction and refused to answer. I watched in mute fascination, my heart pounding from the close call. The officer glanced up and our eyes met. His were a beautiful blue color, like the sea near the shore, blue and interesting, like there was more to discover in their depths. My heart seemed to start beating again and I gasped for air, completely unaware that I had pushed my lungs flat and not breathed since seeing the thief. He nodded once, as if he had been aware of my predicament and willed me back to enough coherence to draw breath. Perhaps that sort of thing happened a lot in his line of work. Not to him obviously. He'd charged in with speed and courage, never once losing sight of his target nor showing any signs of trepidation. I, on the other hand, shook like loose rigging on a sailboat. The officer cuffed the thief with practiced efficiency, his movements swift and sure. He read the man his rights in a low, steady voice, the words carrying an undercurrent of steel that sent a shiver down my spine. A second officer appeared in the doorway, slightly out of breath from his own hasty arrival. He took in the scene with a quick, assessing glance, before striding forward to take hold of the thief. I'll take it from here, O'Malley, he said, his voice crisp and efficient. Good work. The first officer, O'Malley, nodded, relinquishing his grip on the thief and stepping back. Thanks, Bradley. He adjusted his hat, which had come askew and dabbed at the place he'd been hit as if judging the severity of the injury. He lifted a shoulder, deciding it wasn't bad enough to warrant another thought. Looking around, his eyes danced across my face and he removed the hat completely in a show of respect. Bardley led the thief out of the shop, pausing only to tip his hat apologetically at the startled customers and making the woman who had almost fainted giggle. My knees were weak with relief, and I had to grip the edge of the counter to steady myself. Is everyone all right? Officer O'Malley asked, his voice rich and warm, tinged with concern. Did anyone get hurt? He looked pointedly at me. I shook my head mutely, still too shaken to speak. Elena stepped forward and gripped my elbow, her voice trembling slightly as she answered for both of us. We're fine, thanks to you, officer. If you hadn't arrived when you did. 
she trailed off, the unspoken possibilities hanging heavy in the air. Officer O'Malley's expression softened, the effect making him less menacing and much more handsome. Although, the two mixed together was rather distracting in and of itself. A small smile tugged at the corner of his mouth. I'm just glad I could help, he said simply. Elena's arms came around me in a fierce hug. Oh Margaret, are you all right? I was so scared when that man threatened you. I hugged her back, drawing strength from her familiar warmth. I'm fine, thanks to the officer. Mother came over from helping the customer who had knocked over the parasols write the display. We're more than grateful for your service, officer. O'Malley. Benjamin O'Malley. His voice was deep and richly textured, like a finely aged whiskey. I'm just doing my job. No thanks needed. Up close, I could see the faint lines etched around his eyes, the product of too many late nights spent patrolling gaslit streets. But there was a warmth in those blue depths, a glimmer of something that set my pulse racing anew. Nonsense. Mother swatted his modesty away. You were very brave saving my beautiful daughter so quickly. I ducked my head to hide my mortification at her obvious attempt at matchmaking. She may as well have hung a sign in the window that read, Single Daughter, for Marriage. Officer O'Malley grinned, the action transforming his stern features into something altogether more appealing. He winked at me as if he understood exactly what mother was trying to do and didn't hate it. I struggled against the urge to take a moment to compose myself, smoothing the wrinkles from my dress and tucking the wayward strands of hair behind my ears. Miss Sullivan, I presume? He inclined his head in a gesture of respect. Yes. I nodded his way as well, my heart hammering in my chest. My mother chimed in with a sly smile. You should see the hats she creates, Officer O'Malley. Why, last week, the mayor's wife herself commissioned a piece for the Founders' Day celebration. Is that so? Ben's gaze returned to me, curiosity sparking in those blue depths. It seems you are a woman of many talents, Miss Sullivan. I ducked my head, suddenly feeling exposed under the weight of his regard. I simply have a passion for my craft. Passion is a rare and precious thing, he murmured, holding my gaze for a moment too long before clearing his throat. Well, I should be getting back to my rounds. He replaced his hat and tipped the brim in a gesture of farewell. As the door swung shut behind him, I released a breath. That's an impressive man, my mother commented, a knowing glint in her eye as she watched me. Handsome too, don't you think? I wouldn't know, I demurred, suddenly intensely interested in straightening a display of hat pins. He was like a guardian angel, swooping in just in the nick of time, Elena said, a note of wonder in her voice. And did you see the way he took down that thief? I've never seen anything so brave. Her love of dime store novels shone through when she became romantically inclined. I nodded, my mind replaying the officer's swift, decisive actions. There was a coiled power in his movements, a sense of controlled strength that both terrified and thrilled me. My mother laughed, a rich, throaty sound that never failed to lift my spirits. I have a feeling we haven't seen the last of Officer O'Malley. Mother, please, I groaned, covering my flaming cheeks. Deep down, a thrill went through me at the thought that he had been interested in me. Surely she was exaggerating. Shaking my head, I firmly turned my mind back to business. But no matter how I tried, I couldn't stop my traitorous eyes from flickering to the window every few minutes, hoping for a glimpse of navy wool moving through the sea of muted colors. Officer Benjamin O'Malley had gotten under my skin, it seemed. I found myself rather hoping he would return, and soon. With a secret smile, I turned back to my work, my fingers flying over the delicate trims and feathers. As we set about writing the fallen displays and soothing the ruffled patrons, I couldn't shake the feeling of the thief's menacing approach or the profound relief of the officer's timely arrival. It was a stark reminder of the dangers that lurked even in the familiar comfort of my own shop. I felt a stirring of something like admiration in my chest for the officer. Admiration and, gulp, interest. That just wouldn't do. I had already given my heart away and the man took it with him when he left town. After all the pain of losing it once, I simply didn't have it in me to love someone with that kind of passion and devotion ever again. Chapter 2 As much as I tried to put Officer O'Malley out of my mind, he just wouldn't stay away from my thoughts. 
I found myself staring off into the distance more times than I cared to admit over the next two weeks, my mind's eye tracing his strong shoulders or remembering his impertinent wink behind my mother's back. Forgetting him was easier when I was busily engaged in creating a new hat or working on a challenge. Unfortunately for me, challenges were hard to come by. I took solace in the fact that the more time that passed, the less likely it was that he would come back into our store. One day went by, and then two, and I began to relax back into my routine. On the third day, as I wrapped lace around a piece of cardboard, the door opened and I spoke out of habit. Good day, and welcome to Sullivan's Fine Hats. How may I assist? The words die on my lips as I found myself staring into a pair of startlingly familiar ocean blue eyes. Officer O'Malley stood on the threshold, hat in hand, looking somehow larger than life in the cozy confines of our shop. The sunlight filtering through the window caught the golden strands in his chestnut hair, setting them ablaze like a halo around his chiseled features. Miss Sullivan, he greeted me, inclining his head. A faint smile played about his mouth, the sight of it sending a delicious shiver down my spine. I hope I'm not interrupting? Not at all, I managed, cursing the slight tremor in my voice. My heart pounded so loudly, I'm certain he must have heard it. What brings you by, officer? I glanced at the door to the back room where mother searched for a bit of ribbon she was certain we had somewhere. I prayed she would stay out of sight for the duration of the officer's visit and not try to flatter me off on the poor man. He cleared his throat, glancing around the shop before meeting my gaze directly. Those piercing blue eyes seemed to see straight into my soul, leaving me feeling exposed and vulnerable in an enjoyable way. It was like, I could be myself. Which was strange, because with my old boyfriend I was always on proper behavior and light laughter not allowed to tease or make jokes. I was there for looks, not laughter, he'd told me once and like a fool, I'd believed him. I wish to inform you that the thief who attempted to rob your store has been sentenced. He'll be spending the next year in the county jail. Oh. I pressed a hand to my chest, relief and gratitude washing through me in equal measure. The memory of that terrifying moment, of the thief's wild eyes and menacing stance, still haunted my dreams. But knowing that he'd been brought to justice, that he couldn't hurt anyone else, was a weight lifted from my shoulders. That's wonderful news, I breathed, my voice trembling with emotion. I can't thank you enough for your swift action that day, and for following the case through. Surely reporting this to us is going above and beyond. I couldn't believe the officer had taken such a personal interest in our case. Maybe this was normal for him, or for all police officers for all I know. It wasn't like we had a lot of dealings with the police. I was probably stuttering through this conversation like a fool. Officer O'Malley shook his head, a lock of hair falling rakishly over his brow. The urge to reach out and brush it back made my fingers twitch and I blindly grabbed for a bit of lace to keep them occupied. Think nothing of it, Miss Sullivan, he said, his voice low and earnest. I'm grateful I happened to pass by at the right moment. I shuddered to think what might have happened otherwise. His eyes darkened with an emotion I couldn't quite name. Was it concern? Anger? Tenderness? Surely I imagined that last bit. Why should my welfare matter to him beyond a general regard for public safety? And yet, the intensity of his gaze, the way his jaw clenched as if at some unpleasant thought, had sent a flutter of something dangerously close to hope through my chest. I'd had that feeling once before. Hope. And it had been blown to pieces by a goodbye letter. Hope was dangerous and intoxicating. I'd forgotten the pleasurable part of it having lived so long in the aftermath of the explosion. Flustered, I fiddled with the lace in my hands, needing something to occupy my restless fingers. The delicate threads felt cool against my flushed skin, a welcome distraction from the heat of his presence. Yes, well, I stammered, my tongue tripping over the words. Harborview is lucky to have such dedicated officers keeping our streets safe. Could I have said anything more benign? Truly, my abilities to flirt or even slightly entertain the opposite sex had dwindled to platitudes and prattling like a fool. What was it about this man that tied my tongue so? I'd never had trouble conversing with intelligence. I risked a glance at him from beneath my lashes, half afraid of what I might see. But his expression had softened, a small smile playing about his lips that set off a flurry of hummingbird wings in my belly. That's very kind of you to say, he murmured, his voice like honey and smoke. And we're lucky to have such upstanding citizens like yourself, Miss Sullivan. 
Your work here is spoken very highly of throughout the city. My face had warmed with pleasure at his compliment. I'm happy to repay the favor in any way I can, I say, feeling bold. Perhaps I could send around a basket of scones sometime. I trailed off, suddenly unsure. Was that too forward? The last thing I wanted was to appear like some clinging, desperate girl, throwing myself at an uninterested man. Officer O'Malley's eyes crinkle at the corners, his smile widening into a grin that stole my breath away. He took a step closer, the spicy, clean scent of him washed over me like a wave. Sandalwood and starched linen, with a hint of something uniquely him. It made me a little light-headed, my skin prickling with an awareness of his proximity. I certainly wouldn't say no to homemade scones, he said, his voice lowering to a velvety rumble that resonated through my bones. He leaned in even closer, until I could feel the heat of him through the layers of my dress. My mouth went dry, my heart hammering against my ribs like a caged bird. And I confess, he continued, his finger brushing my wrist, I would welcome the chance to thank you for them. Perhaps I could have called on you some. Why, Officer O'Malley? What a delightful surprise. Mother's cheery voice had shattered the intense little bubble surrounding us. I jerked back, face flaming, as she bustled over to shake his hand. As Officer O'Malley turned to greet my mother, ever the gentleman, I caught the flash of regret in his eyes, the slight clench of his jaw. And I realized, with a thrill that set my heart to racing anew, that I wasn't alone in feeling this strange, wonderful connection between us. He charmed my mother for a few moments. I took the opportunity to move to the back of the store under the pretense of looking for more lace and gather my wits. Officer O'Malley took his leave with little more than a wave from me. Even though I'd been caught up in a moment with him, I couldn't afford to let myself get carried away. He was much too handsome and charming for my tastes. Despite those self-preserving thoughts, I drifted to the window, hungry for one more look at Officer O'Malley as he walked away. I stood at the shop window, my gaze fixed on the bustling street as Officer O'Malley's broad-shouldered figure gradually receded into the distance. The muted blues and grays of the city seemed to have swallowed him whole, the sea of top hats and bonnets parting before him like waves breaking against a sturdy ship's hull. My heart fluttered in my chest, a curious mixture of anticipation and uncertainty churning in my stomach. The memory of his piercing blue eyes and the warmth of his smile lingered in my mind, a phantom sensation that refused to dissipate. The rich aroma of freshly brewed coffee brought me to my senses. I turned to find my mother and younger sister watching me watch Benjamin. I felt the heat rise to my cheeks, at the realization that I'd called him by his given name in my mind. He should be Officer O'Malley. Today and always. So why did it seem so natural for me to think of him as Ben? A telltale blush at the thought served to deepen my embarrassment in front of my family. Well, well, mother said, her eyes twinkling with amusement as she noticed my distracted state. It seems our Margaret has found herself quite the admirer. She sipped her coffee. I busied myself with straightening the delicate lace trim on a nearby bonnet, avoiding their knowing gazes. I don't know what you're talking about, I mumbled, my fingers fumbling with the intricate embroidery. Officer O'Malley was just doing his job, that's all. Elena, ever the mischievous one, sidled up to me with a grin that spelled trouble. Oh, come now Margaret. We saw the way he looked at you. Like a man who's just discovered a rare treasure. I shot her a withering glare, but the effect was somewhat diminished by the persistent flush in my cheeks. Don't be ridiculous. We barely know each other. Mother clucked her tongue, her expression softening as she laid a gentle hand on my shoulder. Margaret, dear, there's no shame in admitting you're drawn to him. He seems like a fine man. I sighed, the weight of my past heartbreak settling heavily in my chest. It had been over a year since I was shattered and left alone, and the wound still felt raw and tender. I'm not ready, I whispered, my voice cracking slightly. I can't go through that again. Elena's face fell, her teasing smile fading into a look of concern. She wrapped an arm around my waist, pulling me close. Oh, Maggie. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. I leaned into her embrace, drawing strength from the solid warmth of her presence. It's all right, Ellie. I know you mean well. Mother watched us with a thoughtful expression, her brow furrowed in contemplation. Margaret, I understand your hesitation. 
but you can't let one bad experience close your heart off forever. She took my hands in hers, her calloused fingers rough against my skin. If you truly feel a connection with Officer O'Malley, you owe it to yourself to explore it. Take things slowly, of course. But don't be afraid to open yourself up to the possibility of love again. I swallowed hard, my throat tight with emotion. Deep down, I knew she was right. I couldn't hide behind my fear forever, no matter how tempting it might be. I don't even know where to start, I admitted, my voice small and uncertain. What if he doesn't feel the same way? Elena's eyes lit up, a mischievous grin spreading across her face. Well, you know what they say, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. I raised an eyebrow, not quite following her train of thought. What do you mean? She laughed, giving me a playful nudge. I mean, why don't you bake him some of your famous cinnamon scones? Like you teased him about. No man can resist them. I stared at her, my mouth falling open in surprise. Elena Sullivan, were you eavesdropping on our conversation? She had the grace to look slightly abashed, but the twinkle in her eye remained. I may have overheard a thing or two. But that's beside the point. The point is, it's the perfect excuse to see him again. Mother nodded, a smile tugging at the corners of her mouth. I think it's a lovely idea Margaret. A gesture of goodwill, to thank him for his bravery. I hesitated, my mind racing with doubts and uncertainties. But the more I thought about it, the more the idea appealed to me. It was a small step, a way to reach out without putting my heart on the line just yet. Besides, if he'd truly been about to ask me if he could call on me again, then this would give him the opportunity to do so. If not, then I'd done my duty to thank a fine officer for saving me and I could move on. All right, I said at last, squaring my shoulders with a newfound sense of determination. I'll do it. I'll bake him some scones. Elena clapped her hands in delight, practically bouncing on her toes. Excellent. Now, off you go. You have work to do. I shook my head, a reluctant smile tugging at my lips as I gathered my things. Trust Elena to turn a simple act of gratitude into a grand romantic gesture. As I stepped out into the bustling streets, the crisp spring air filled my lungs, invigorating me with its brisk freshness. The scent of roasting chestnuts and burning leaves mingled with the ever-present tang of salt from the nearby harbor, a heady combination that never failed to stir my senses. I made my way through the winding streets, my mind already racing ahead to the task at hand. I mentally catalogued the ingredients I would need. As I passed by the schoolyard, I caught sight of my dear friend Tabitha, her auburn curls glinting in the sunlight as she watched over her young charges with a maternal air. The two-story red brick school building loomed behind her, a sturdy and imposing structure that housed the laughter, learning, and occasional tears of the children who spent their days within its walls. The schoolyard itself was a bustling hub of activity, with children of various ages running, playing, and chattering excitedly. A group of young boys kicked a ball back and forth, their shouts of glee carrying across the yard. Nearby, a cluster of girls sat in a circle, engrossed in a game of Nathan's, their small hands deftly scooping up the tiny metal pieces. Amidst the chaos, Tabitha stood as a calm and reassuring presence. She moved with a gentle grace, her long skirt swishing around her ankles as she navigated the playground. Every now and then, she would pause to tie a shoelace, wipe a tear-stained cheek, or offer a word of encouragement to a shy child hovering on the fringes of the fun. As I drew nearer, Tabitha looked up, her face breaking into a warm smile. Her hazel eyes sparkled with genuine affection, and the lines around them crinkled in a way that spoke of countless moments of laughter and joy. She raised a hand in greeting, beckoning me closer, eager to share a few moments of conversation. Margaret! What brings you out and about on this fine day? I hesitated, suddenly feeling self-conscious about my mission. But Tabitha had always been a trusted confidant, and I found myself spilling the whole story about the robbery before I could think better of it. Her expression grew serious as I spoke. The concern in her eyes was evident. Oh, dear, Tabitha said, reaching out to give my arm a comforting squeeze. How frightening that must have been for you. I'm so glad that Officer O'Malley was there to help. I nodded. I don't know what I would have done without him, I admitted, my voice trembling slightly at the memory. He was so brave, Tabitha. And kind, too. Tabitha's face softened, her eyes shining with understanding. 
He sounds like a true gentleman, she said, a note of approval in her voice. I'm baking scones for him, I admitted, my cheeks warming at the admission. As a thank you, for what he did. I know it's not much, but I wanted to show him how much I appreciate his kindness. Tabitha's eyes widened, a knowing gleam sparking in their green depths. I see. And this has nothing to do with the fact that he's devastatingly handsome and heroic, I'm sure. I sputtered, my face flushing even hotter. Tabitha. It's not like that. I barely know the man. She laughed, a rich, throaty sound that never failed to lift my spirits. Oh Margaret. You may be able to fool yourself, but you can't fool me. You have that look in your eye. I opened my mouth to protest, but she held up a hand to silence me. Don't worry, your secret is safe with me. But for what it's worth, I think it's a wonderful idea. The man deserves a little sweetness in his life, after all he does for this city. I smiled, feeling a rush of affection for my dear friend. Thank you. She waved off my gratitude with a playful grin. Oh, go on with you. You have scones to bake and a handsome officer to woo. I laughed, shaking my head as I bid her farewell and continued on my way. As I left, I couldn't help but notice the way the schoolmaster smiled at Tabitha through the window, his eyes crinkling at the corners with a warmth that spoke of a deep and abiding affection. The two of them had become tentative friends, their mutual affection not yet declared. Hopefully, they would work it all out soon. I felt a pang of longing in my chest. Perhaps mother was right. Perhaps it was time to open myself up to the possibility of love again, even if it meant risking the pain of heartbreak. With renewed determination, I quickened my pace, eager to get home and begin my baking. The familiar ritual of measuring and mixing, kneading and shaping, had always been a balm to my soul, a way to quiet the tumult of my thoughts and focus on the simple things. As I worked, my mind drifted to Officer O'Malley, to the undeniable spark that had passed between us in our brief moments of connection. I wondered what he would think of my gesture, if he would see it for the tentative olive branch it was meant to be. The scent of warm cinnamon and butter filled the air, mingling with the rich aroma of freshly brewed coffee and the faint tang of the salty sea breeze that drifted through the open window. It was a comforting blend, a reminder of all the things that made this city feel like home. As I pulled the scones from the oven, their golden brown crusts glistening with a light brushing of sugar, I felt a sense of satisfaction wash over me. They were perfect, just the way I remembered my grandmother making them when I was a little girl. I arranged them carefully in a basket, tucking a small note of thanks in between the layers of crisp linen. It was a simple message, but one that I hoped would convey the depth of my gratitude for all that he had done. As I washed the last of the dishes, my mind buzzed with anticipation, my thoughts consumed by the possibility of seeing him again. I felt a flicker of excitement deep within my chest, a tiny flame of hope that refused to be extinguished no matter how much I tried to temper it. As I dried my hands on my apron, a sudden realization struck me like a bolt of lightning. I had no idea where Officer O'Malley lived. My heart sank, a leaden weight settling in the pit of my stomach. How could I have been so foolish, so caught up in my own romantic fantasies that I hadn't even considered the practicalities of delivering my gift? Without his address, I'd have to take them to the station. The very thought sent a shiver of apprehension down my spine. The station house was a foreign world to me, a place of danger and intrigue that I had only ever glimpsed from afar. A surge of panic rushed within me. The thought of walking into the police station, of facing the curious stares and knowing smirks of the officers as I searched for Officer O'Malley, was almost too much to bear. I could imagine their whispers, their barely concealed amusement at the sight of a flustered young woman, clutching a basket of baked goods, her cheeks flushed with embarrassment. And yet, what choice did I have? I couldn't simply abandon my plan, not after all the effort I had put into it. To back out now would be to let my own insecurities and fears triumph over my desire to do something good, something meaningful. I would have to summon every ounce of courage I possessed, to hold my head high and march through those doors with my basket held firmly in my hands. It would be a test of my resolve, a challenge to my own sense of self, but I knew that I had no other choice. With a deep breath and a silent prayer for strength, I gathered my supplies and set out into the bright afternoon light, my heart pounding with a mixture of fear and determination. Come what may, I was determined to see this through. And as the imposing brick facade of the station house loomed before me, I felt a small smile tug at the corners of my mouth. I was ready. 
ready to take that first step towards a new beginning, no matter where it might lead. Chapter 3 The wicker basket trembled in my grasp as I approached the Harborview Police Station, its red brick facade looming before me like a fortress. The building stood tall and imposing, its windows gleaming in the afternoon sun. The American flag fluttered proudly above the entrance, a symbol of the authority and justice that resided within these walls. I paused on the threshold, my heart pounding an erratic rhythm against my ribs. The scent of freshly baked scones wafted from the basket, a comforting aroma amidst the unfamiliar surroundings. The warm, buttery fragrance mingled with the crisp spring air. Gritting my teeth, I summoned every ounce of courage and stepped inside. The heavy wooden door creaked on its hinges, making me cringe. No one paid any notice to me though. The station buzzed with activity, a hive of blue uniforms and purposeful strides. Officers hurried past, their polished boots clicking against the worn wooden floorboards. The sound echoed through the high, ceilinged room, a staccato beat that reminded me of the relentless march of time. The air hummed with a mixture of hushed conversations and the rustling of papers. Snippets of dialogue floated past me, tales of crime and punishment, of justice served and wrongs righted. The faint scent of coffee and ink mingled with the aroma of my scones, making me wonder if this was a good idea. I felt small and insignificant amidst the chaos, a mere speck in the grand scheme of things. The officers moved with a sense of purpose and determination, their eyes hard and their jaws set. They were the guardians of the city. I felt the weight of their gazes upon me, but I refused to be cowed. I'd gotten this far already, and I wouldn't scuttle away. I straightened my spine and squared my shoulders, the basket a talisman of my resolve. I had come here for a reason, and I would not be deterred by the overwhelming masculinity of my surroundings. With a deep breath, I stepped forward. The wicker basket swayed gently in my grasp, a reminder of the sweetness and warmth that I carried with me that was in deep contrast with the men's gruff voices and clipped words. I scanned the room, my gaze darting from desk to desk until it settled on a familiar figure. There, amidst the controlled chaos, sat Officer Benjamin O'Malley. His broad shoulders filled out his uniform, the brass buttons gleaming in the soft light filtering through the dusty windows. A lock of hair fell across his forehead as he bent over a stack of reports, his brow furrowed in concentration. Stealing myself, I wove through the desks, the basket clutched tightly to my chest. As I drew closer, Ben looked up, his piercing blue eyes widening in surprise. A smile tugged at the corners of his mouth, transforming his stern features into something warmer, more inviting. Miss Sullivan, he greeted, rising from his chair. What brings you to the station? I glanced at those giving us the side eye. With trembling hands, I held out the basket, the wicker handle smooth against my palms. I baked these for you, I said, my cheeks flushing and my words halting. All the pretty speeches I'd mentally written fluttered away like criminals in the face of the law. Ben's gaze fell to the basket, his expression softening. His eyes, once sharp and alert, now held a warmth that made my breath catch in my throat. He reached out, his fingers brushing against mine as he accepted the offering. The brief contact sent a jolt of electricity through my veins, a searing heat that raced from my fingertips to my heart. It was a moment frozen in time, a fleeting connection that seemed to stretch into eternity. The rough calluses on his fingers, born from years of handling firearms and grappling with criminals, rasped against my smooth skin. The contrast was startling, a reminder of the different worlds we inhabited. And yet, in that moment, none of it mattered. The chaos of the station faded away, the voices of the officers nothing more than a distant hum. All that existed was the warmth of his touch, the gentle pressure of his fingers against mine. I fought the urge to snatch my hand away because of the intensity, to break the spell that had fallen over us. Every instinct screamed at me to run, to flee from the emotions that coursed through me. But I remained rooted to the spot, my eyes locked with his, my heart pounding a furious rhythm in my chest. That's very kind of you, Miss Sullivan, he said, his voice low and sincere. I'm touched by your thoughtfulness. As he withdrew his hand, the basket now safely in his grasp, I felt a pang of loss, a hollow ache that settled in the pit of my stomach. The ghost of his touch lingered on my skin, a phantom sensation that I knew would haunt me in the days to come. The air crackled with a new energy, a tension that hadn't been there before. It was a dance of sorts, a delicate balancing act between the propriety of our stations and the undeniable pull of attraction. 
I swallowed hard, my mouth suddenly dry. I knew that I should say something, anything to break the charged silence that had fallen over us, but the words stuck in my throat, my tongue heavy and useless in my mouth. And so I simply stood there, my heart racing and my skin tingling with the memory of his touch. A throat cleared nearby, breaking the spell. The sound was harsh and abrupt. I blinked, the world rushing back in with startling clarity. Heat rose to my cheeks as I realized we had an audience. Several officers had gathered around, their expressions ranging from amused to curious. Some leaned against desks, their arms crossed over their chests, while others stood with their hands resting on their belts, their fingers brushing against the polished metal of their badges. Their faces were a study in contrast, some lined with the wisdom of age, others fresh and youthful. All bore the same look of interest, their eyes darting between Ben and myself with barely concealed glee. Looks like O'Malley's got himself an admirer, one of them teased, nudging his companion with an elbow. The man was older, his hair graying at the temples, his eyes sparkling with mischief. He had the look of a seasoned veteran, a man who had seen his fair share of love-struck civilians over the years. His companion, a younger officer with a shock of red hair and a dusting of freckles across his nose, grinned broadly. Can't blame the lady, he chimed in, his voice rich with good humor. O'Malley's a regular knight in shining armor. The words hung in the air, a playful jab that sent a fresh wave of heat rushing to my cheeks. I ducked my head, suddenly fascinated by the polished toes of my boots. I could feel the weight of their gazes upon me, the prickle of their curiosity and amusement dancing across my skin. But beneath the teasing and the laughter, I sensed a deeper undercurrent of respect and admiration. These men, these officers of the law, held Ben in high regard. They saw in him a man of honor and integrity. They spoke with genuine affection, much like when Elena teased me. They were more than just colleagues, I realized. They were a brotherhood, a family bound by the badge and the oath they had sworn to serve and protect. The moment stretched on, the silence broken only by the occasional chuckle or good-natured jibe. Though Ben must be just as embarrassed as I, he showed no sign of it, his shoulders squared and his head held high. I felt a flicker of pride kindle in my chest at his unwavering strength. For this man, this brave and honorable officer, had chosen to share a moment with me. Ben shot them a warning look, his brows furrowed and his mouth set in a firm line. Even as he fixed them with a stern gaze, I caught the faint twitch of his lips that betrayed his true feelings. All right, boys, he said, his voice ringing out with authority. That's enough fun for one day. Don't you have work to do? His words were met with a chorus of good-natured groans and chuckles, the officers shuffling their feet and exchanging rueful glances. You heard the man, the older officer said, clapping his companion on the shoulder. Back to the grind. The younger officer sighed, his freckled face creasing in a rueful grin. I, I, Captain, he said, sketching a mock salute in Ben's direction. The crowd began to disperse, the officers drifting back to their desks and their duties. The air buzzed with the hum of renewed activity, the clatter of typewriters and the murmur of conversation filling the station once more. Ben turned back to me, his expression apologetic. His eyes were soft and warm, the blue depth sparkling with a mix of embarrassment and contrition. Pay them no mind, Miss Sullivan, he said, his voice low and soothing. They're just having a bit of fun. I could hear the sincerity in his words, the gentle reassurance that flowed from his lips like honey. The tension began to drain from my body, the knots in my shoulders loosening and the flutter in my stomach settling. I know, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. It's just. I'm not used to being the center of attention like that. Ben's eyes crinkling at the corners in a way that made my heart skip a beat. I understand, he said, his voice warm and compassionate. It can be overwhelming, especially in a place like this. He gestured around the station. His words were like a bomb to my frayed nerves, a soothing whisper that chased away the last of my doubts and fears. My eyes locking with his, I felt a rush of affection that threatened to overwhelm me. For in that moment, I saw the true measure of the man before me. Not just a brave and honorable officer, but a kind and compassionate soul, a man who could see beyond the surface and into the heart of things. He was more than the handsome face and brave officer who'd saved me. He could be so much more than that to me, if I let him. My heart raced and I nodded. I should be going, I murmured, needing an escape. 
Being vulnerable did not sit well with me and I was too interested in Ben to not include my heart in the equation. The thought was truly terrifying. I don't want to keep you from your work. Ben hesitated, as if he wanted to say something more, but thought better of it. Thank you again for the scones, he said instead, his smile warm and genuine. I'm sure they'll be the envy of the entire station. I managed a small smile in return, my nerves slowly settling. You're welcome, Officer O'Malley. I hope you enjoy them. With a final nod, I turned to leave, the eyes of the officers following me as I made my way back through the desks. I could feel Ben's gaze on my back, a palpable touch that sent warm shivers across my shoulders. As I stepped out into the waning sunlight, I let out a shaky breath, my heart still fluttering in my chest. The encounter had been both exhilarating and terrifying, a heady mixture of emotions that left me reeling. The trees that lined the street were just getting into their full leaves and they rustled in the breeze like applause. I was rather proud of myself for accomplishing my mission. I made my way back to the shop, my mind replaying every moment of the exchange between us, from the brush of his hand against mine to his stalwart nature and then to his soft farewell. The way Ben's eyes had lit up when he saw me, the warmth of his smile, all of it brought me to that place where my head was lighter than the rest of my body and I want to just float away. Each detail was seared into my memory, a precious treasure to be savored in the quiet moments of the day. My excitement began to wear off as I realized the initial purpose of making the scones and visiting him at the station was to give him the opportunity to ask to see me again, and he didn't. I tried not to feel disappointed that he hadn't, attempting to find contentment in our brief but meaningful exchange. However, sadness tugged at my awareness, refusing to be ignored. It was a bittersweet feeling, the joy of our connection mingling with the longing for something more. I couldn't help but wonder if he felt the same way, if he too was replaying our moments together in his mind. Perhaps it was too soon, or maybe he was simply being cautious. We were in the police station, where the watchful eyes of Ben's fellow officers had been upon us. It was hardly the ideal setting for a budding romance, and I couldn't help but wonder if the lack of privacy had played a role in Ben's decision not to ask for a future meeting. Despite my attempts to rationalize the situation, the disappointment lingered, a subtle ache in my chest. Lost in my thoughts, I almost didn't notice how close I was to the shop until it came into view. The sight of it brought a small smile to my lips, a reminder of the life I had built for myself. It was a testament to my strength and resilience, a place where I could pour my heart into my work and find fulfillment in the simple act of creating. Elena waited for me near the front window, her face alight with curiosity. Her presence was a comfort, a reminder that no matter what happened with Ben, I had a sister who would always be there for me. With a deep breath, I pushed open the door, ready for the Grand Inquisition. Well, she demanded. How did it go? She clasped her hands in front of her chest and lifted to her toes. I couldn't help but smile at her enthusiasm. It was nice, I said, trying to keep my tone casual. Nice? Elena's eyebrows shot up, a knowing grin spreading across her face. Just nice, she teased. Come on, Margaret. Tell me absolutely everything. She all but tugged my arm off in her insistence. My checks grew warm, and I busied myself with straightening a display of hats to avoid her gaze. There isn't much to tell. I dopped my eyes. Elena sighed, her expression softening. Margaret? I gulped. We had a moment. I thought that perhaps he would ask to see me again. I glanced away, my disappointment heavy. When I looked up, Elena's eyes were soft and sympathetic as she reached out to cover my hand with her own. Oh Margaret, she said, her voice gentle and soothing. You can't give up hope so easily. I sighed, my shoulders slumping as I stared down at the table. I'm a simple hatmaker, and he's, he's a hero. Elena's lips curved in a small, knowing smile. You, my dear sister, are a catch. Any man would be lucky to have you. I shook my head, my throat tightening with emotion. If that were true, then why did William leave? Why did he choose his dreams over our future together? I swiped at my brimming eyes, hating that even now William could make me cry. Elena's grip on my hand tightened, her eyes flashing with a fierce protectiveness. William was a fool, she said, her voice low and intense. He didn't deserve you, Margaret. He never did. 
I swallowed hard, blinking back the tears that threatened to spill down my cheeks. But what if, what if Officer O'Malley feels the same way? What if he looks at me and sees nothing but a silly girl? Elena's expression softened, her eyes crinkling at the corners as she smiled. Trust me, Margaret. That man is not going to be able to stay away from you. Not with all of your many charms. I raised an eyebrow, a small, disbelieving laugh escaping my lips. You mean like my ability to trim a bonnet or stitch a veil? Elena rolled her eyes, her grin widening. Don't forget your ability to make cinnamon scones that would single-handedly stop an advancing army. No, you goose. I mean your kindness, your compassion, your strength. The way you light up a room just by walking into it. The way you make everyone around you feel seen and heard and valued. I felt a blush creep up my neck, my cheeks growing warm at her words. You're just saying that because you're my sister. Elena shook her head, her expression serious, once more. No, I'm not. You deserve to be loved, wholly and completely. And I have a feeling that Officer O'Malley might just be the man to do it. And if he doesn't come to his senses soon, then I'll just have to take matters into my own hands. She shook a fist in the air. I laughed, the sound bright and clear in the quiet of the shop. Oh, no. I don't even want to think about what that might entail. Elena grinned, her eyes sparkling with mischief. Trust me, you don't. But let's just say that it would involve a lot of ribbons, a few strategically placed hatpins, and possibly a bonnet or two. I shook my head, a smile tugging at the corners of my lips. You're incorrigible, you know that? Elena shrugged, her grin widening. It's part of my charm. And speaking of charm, let's see about putting some of that famous Sullivan magic to work on Mrs. Dunderson's hat. After all, you never know when a certain dashing officer might come calling. She pulled me into the stockroom where our work table was clean, a testament to the nervous energy mother put to good use while I was gone. I was dearly loved by my family. And it should be enough. But a part of me wanted to find a safe harbor in the arms of a man I loved and who loved me in return. Maybe Ben was that man and I'd missed my chance with him. A part of me dismissed that idea. Harborview was a big city, but it wasn't so large that I wouldn't see him again. If God wanted us together, he would make it happen. I had enough faith to wait, at least one more day. Maybe two. Chapter 4 Turned out, my faith was stronger than I thought it was. I didn't see Ben for almost a week. I'd like to say that the preparations for Patriot's Day kept me too busy to think about him, but that would be a lie and I consider myself an honest woman. I did think about him, however, I was too busy to obsess and that was a wonderful thing. We had worked so hard OT prepare the fine ladies of Harborview for the celebration that we decided to close the shop and take the day off to admire our handiwork and enjoy the festivities. It all started at the local school grounds where the air was filled with the tantalizing aroma of freshly baked apple pies and roasted chestnuts, mingling with the lively strains of fiddle music that drifted on the breeze. Colorful banners fluttered in the wind, their vibrant hues a testament to the joy and pride that filled the hearts of every Harbor Viewian on this special day. I stood with Elena as the school children performed their reenactment of the Revolutionary War and the defeat of the British at Beacon Hill. The orator who normally narrated the program was missing and in his place stood the new headmaster. He stood tall, his voice strong and carrying to the farthest corners of the schoolyard. He was quite handsome and young. Elena and I weren't the only women who noticed him, but there was one lady in particular who stood with starstruck attention as he spoke. My friend, Tabitha's heart was in her eyes. No doubt, Daniel's NAME dollar oration abilities increased her reluctant fondness for her boss. It would be interesting to see how things worked out for them. Tabitha was a sworn spinster, dedicated to her calling as a teacher. As I listened to Daniel's strong and deep voice ring out, I reasoned that he may be the exact type of man to break her vows and inspire her to make new ones with him. The pageant finished with a 21-gun salute in honor of the fallen soldiers who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. The gunshots further excited the children and added to the sense of patriotic pride that filled the air. Elena spied some friends and peeled away from me, ready to sample the popcorn and roasted peanuts for sale. Today was not a day of responsibilities and I waved her off to play and flirt with the many young men who flocked to her. She was the true beauty of the family, 
All the sisters agreed, and in her new white dress with blue trim and tiny red roses, she was the picture of perfection. Alone now, I navigated through the bustling crowds, nodding to customers and greeting neighbors and friends. Through it all, my eyes scanned the sea of faces, searching for Ben O'Malley. Surely he would be on duty, unless assigned to another part of the city for the day. Despite the uncertainty over his feelings and intentions toward me, I couldn't deny the thrill that coursed through my veins at the prospect of seeing him again. The sounds of laughter and chatter swirled around me, a symphony of happiness that filled the air. Children raced past, their faces alight with excitement as they chased after spinning tops and colorful balloons. I approached Alice, the owner of Seaside Pages, and her new husband, Nathan, with a smile, my voice ringing out in greeting. Alice. Captain Nathan. How wonderful to see you both. Alice turned, her green eyes sparkling with joy as she caught sight of me. She wore a darling navy blue dress with white stars all over it. Captain Nathan looked dashing in his captain's jacket, the button gleaming. Margaret, my dear! Alice exclaimed, pulling me into a warm embrace. I'm so glad you made it to the celebration. I wouldn't miss it for the world, I replied, returning her hug with equal enthusiasm. Tell me, what have you and Captain Nathan been up to lately? Any new adventures on the horizon? Alice's face lit up, her cheeks flushed with excitement. You won't believe it. Nathan took me out to sea last week, and it was simply magical. The salty breeze whipping through my hair, the endless expanse of blue stretching out before us. It was like something out of a dream. She leaned in closer, her voice lowering to a conspiratorial whisper. And that's not even the best part. Nathan has been asked to captain the boat that will be used to launch the fireworks display over the water tonight. Can you imagine? It's such an important task that will benefit the whole city. I could see the pride shining in her eyes, the love and admiration she held for her husband evident in every word. That's incredible, Alice, I said, my own heart swelling with happiness for my friend. I can't think of anyone more deserving of such an honor. Captain Nathan chuckled, his arm tightening around Alice's waist. I, my bonnie wife, you're giving me too much credit, he said, his voice deep and rumbling, it is an honor to be part of the celebration in such a grand way. Alice beamed up at him, her eyes shining with adoration. Don't be so modest, she chided gently. As I listened to their banter, I couldn't help but feel a pang of longing in my own heart. The love and devotion that Alice and Nathan shared was a rare and precious thing, it was the kind of love I had always dreamed of finding for myself. Come on, lass. Nathan tugged Alice toward the pie cellars. One slice, and then I'd best be back to the ship. Alice gave me a wave. I'll stop by for a chat soon, okay? I'll make tea. I waved and nodded. A familiar voice cut through the din of the crowd. It was commanding and sure, though kind and encouraging to the youth he was directing away from a display of quilts. They had blueberry pie fingers and faces, and the quilting bee ladies were nearly in a snit over their proximity. Ben O'Malley. My breath caught in my throat as I watched him stride forward. I'd forgotten how handsome he is, I whispered to myself. He was a sight to behold, a vision of strength and courage in his crisp police uniform. The sun glinted off the brass buttons, casting a warm glow across his chiseled features. His eyes, a piercing blue, locked with mine, and I felt a rush of electricity course through my veins. As he drew closer, a smile spread across his lips, warm and genuine. Miss Sullivan, he greeted, his voice deep and rich, sending a shiver down my spine. I was hoping to see you here today. He was? Goodness. A blush creeped into my cheeks, my heart fluttering wildly in my chest. Officer O'Malley, I managed, my voice barely above a whisper. It's a pleasure to see you again. He reached out, taking my hand in his, his touch sending a jolt of electricity through my body. The pleasure is all mine, he murmured, his eyes never leaving mine. We stared at one another like awkward teenagers whose tongues didn't know how to work until Ben was bumped from behind by a man carrying several plates of food. Sorry, he said as he continued without pausing. Ben glanced around, his eyes landing on a game booth. The bright colors and cheerful music beckoned us closer. A glint of determination entered his gaze. He turned to me. 
Care to try your luck, Miss Sullivan? He asked, gesturing to the array of prizes that hung from the booth's canopy. I grinned, feeling a rush of playful competitiveness and much more bold since he sought me out. As one of four girls, I could hold my own in many a competition. Only if you're prepared to lose Officer O'Malley, I teased, my voice light and challenging. He chuckled, his eyes crinkling at the corners in the most handsome way. We'll see about that, he handed over a coin to pay for our games. The game was simple enough, tossing a small wooden ring onto the necks of glass bottles arranged in a triangle. The prizes ranged from small trinkets to larger stuffed animals, each one more tempting than the last. I stepped up first, my eyes narrowing in concentration as I took aim. The first ring sailed wide, missing the bottles entirely. I could hear Ben's soft laughter behind me, and I shot him a playful glare over my shoulder. Don't get too cocky officer, I warned, my voice laced with mock severity. I'm just warming up. My next two throws were closer, but still not quite on target. I sighed, stepping back to let Ben have his turn. He stepped forward, his posture relaxed and confident. I watched in amazement as he tossed the first ring with a flick of his wrist, sending it spinning perfectly onto the neck of the center bottle. Beginner's luck, I called out, trying to hide my impressed smile. He landed the next two rings with equal precision. I had to admit that luck had little to do with it. The booth's attendant grinned, gesturing to the array of prizes. Take your pick sir, he said. Ben turned to me, his eyes soft and questioning. What do you think Miss Sullivan? Which one catches your fancy? I scanned the prizes, my gaze landing on a delicate silver locket hanging from a velvet ribbon. It was simple, yet elegant, a perfect match for the understated beauty of the day. That one, I said, pointing to the locket with a smile. Ben nodded, reaching up to claim the prize. He turned back to me, holding out the locket with a flourish. For you Miss Sullivan, he said, his voice low and intimate. A small token of my esteem. Did he mean that? I hesitated to accept his gift. I wanted to believe that he did mean his words, that this moment of flirting was more to him as it was to me. Trusting myself and my intuition was difficult after I'd been so wrong about William. I wanted to try though. Thank you, I murmured, my voice soft and sincere. It's beautiful. He smiled, his eyes shining with a warmth that made my heart flutter in my chest. Not nearly as beautiful who lost at ring toss, he replied, his voice low and teasing. I scoffed. This time. He grinned. May I? he asked, lifting the locket. I nodded, and turned so he could place the locket around my neck and secure it in the back. He stepped closer, his fingers gently brushing against the nape of my neck as he tied the velvet ribbon. His touch sent a shiver down my spine, and I could feel the warmth of his breath against my skin. There, he said softly, his hands lingering for a moment, before he stepped back. Perfect. I ducked my head, feeling a rush of pleasure at his words. I reached up, my fingers lightly tracing the delicate silver pendant now resting just below the hollow of my throat. The locket felt warm against my skin, a tangible reminder of this moment we had shared. I'll cherish it always, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Ben's smile widened, his eyes holding mine in a gaze that spoke volumes. In that moment, I felt a connection between us, something that went beyond mere flirtation. It was a feeling I hadn't experienced in a long time, and it both thrilled and terrified me. Ben let out a long, suffering sigh. His expression turned serious and full of regret. I'm afraid I have to get back to work Miss Sullivan. My heart sank, but I forced a smile, determined not to let my own selfish desires overshadow the importance of his work. Of course, I said, my voice steady and full of understanding. The city needs you. Ben nodded, his eyes searching mine for a long moment. I was hoping. I was hoping we might meet up again later, at the fireworks display tonight. If you're free, that is. I felt a glimmer of hope in my chest. I would love that, I said, my voice soft. Ben's eyes sparkling with joy. Then it's a date, he said, his voice full of anticipation. Shall we meet in front of Seaside Pages? I thrilled. A date? A date. He proclaimed it out loud and didn't take it back. My smile was so big it almost hurt. I'll be there. Wonderful. 
He briefly touched my hand and then disappeared into the crowd with a final glance over his shoulder, a promise of things to come. I stood there for a long moment, my heart racing with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. I had a date for the fireworks. Chapter 5 The night air was electric with anticipation as I arrived at Seaside Pages, Alice's bookshop located along the harbor. It was closed for the night, Alice joining Nathan on the ship where they lit the fireworks. I couldn't blame her for wanting to be on the water. The fireworks would be thrilling from shore, but up close they would be overwhelming. It seemed as though the entire city had turned out for the fireworks display, the streets teeming with families and couples, children, allowed to stay up well past their bedtimes, darting between the legs of the adults. The air was alive with the tantalizing aromas of street fare, each vendor's offerings more tempting than the last. The sizzle of grilled meats mingled with the sweet, sugary fragrance of funnel cakes and candied apples, creating a symphony of scents that made my mouth water and my stomach rumble with anticipation. Everywhere I looked, people were lined up at the various stalls and carts, eagerly awaiting their turn to sample the delectable treats. Children clutched paper cones filled with roasted peanuts, their eyes wide with delight. Couples shared bags of warm, buttery popcorn, their fingers brushing together as they reached into the bag for another handful. The vendors themselves were a lively bunch, their voices ringing out above the din of the crowd as they hawked their wares with enthusiasm and charm. Get your hot dogs here, one man with the Agerman accent called out, his apron stained with mustard and ketchup. Fresh off the grill and ready to eat. The warmth and energy of the crowd was infectious, and I found myself caught up in the festive atmosphere. I scanned the sea of faces, my heart a flutter with nerves and excitement. Somewhere amidst the throng was Ben, the man who had captured my attention with his bravery and kindness. My mother and sister walked beside me, their faces alight with joy as they took in the sights and sounds of the evening. Elena, ever the social butterfly, had already spotted a group of her friends and was itching to join them, her feet tapping impatiently against the cobblestone streets. Go on, I said, nudging her with my elbow. I'll be fine. You too, mother. We'd passed her group of church widows half a block back. They were wonderful women, all widowed young, who worked to make this city a better place. Mother was the oldest of the group and the wisest who dished out advice, like ginger cookies. Elena hesitated for a moment, her eyes searching mine for any sign of reluctance. But when she saw the determination in my gaze, she grinned, pressing a quick kiss to my cheek, before darting off into the crowd. No doubt there were several young men awaiting her arrival, and she would make their night simply by bestowing one of her smiles upon them. My mother, ever the voice of caution, placed a gentle hand on my arm. Are you sure you'll be all right, dear? she asked, her brow furrowed with concern. I know you've been looking forward to this, but I worry about you being alone in such a large crowd. I smiled, touched by her concern. I'll be fine mother, I assured her, my voice steady and confident. Ben will be here soon, and I know he'll look after me. As the words left my lips, I felt a flutter of anticipation in my chest. I trust him, I added softly, almost to myself. The realization caught me off guard. Trust didn't come easily to me, not after everything I'd been through. But with Ben, it felt different. There was a sense of safety and security in his presence. My mother's expression softened, and she reached out to squeeze my hand. Ah, yes. The dashing officer O'Malley, she said, her voice laced with amusement. I have no doubt he'll be a perfect gentleman. With a final squeeze of my hand, my mother melted into the crowd, leaving me alone amidst the sea of revelers. I took a deep breath, the salty air filling my lungs and calmed my racing heart. I loved living by the sea. It was large and almost unfathomable to my mind at the distance between our shores and the next. The steady sound of the waves against the soar was soothing in a unique way. I spotted Ben weaving his way through the crowd, his tall frame easily distinguishable amidst the sea of faces. He was dressed in a dashing ensemble that perfectly suited the occasion, his attire a far cry from the crisp uniform I was accustomed to seeing him wear. A well, tailored black suit accentuated his broad shoulders and trim waist, the fine wool fabric a testament to his impeccable taste. Beneath the jacket, a crisp white shirt and black silk necktie provided a striking contrast, the high collar and intricate knot a nod to the fashions of the day, which I totally appreciated. My own dress was based off an image in the Paris fashion magazine that graced our shelves, the very one ladies poured over for inspiration. 
His trousers, also black and expertly tailored, fell in a straight line from his hips to his polished black leather shoes, the hem brushing the top of his ankle in a manner that was both stylish and practical. It was the small details that truly set Ben apart from the other men in the crowd. A gleaming silver watch chain stretched across his waistcoat, the intricate links catching the light as he moved. A black top hat, perched at a jaunty angle atop his head, added a touch of whimsy to his otherwise serious attire and telling me that he was here for a night of fun. He caught sight of me and his face broke into a wide grin, his eyes alight with joy and excitement. He quickened his pace, dodging around groups of chattering women and boisterous children until he reached my side. Miss Sullivan, he greeted, his voice warm and full of affection. You look lovely this evening. I ducked my head, feeling a rush of pleasure at his words. Thank you, officer. O'Malley, I replied, my voice soft and full of warmth. You look quite dashing yourself. Ben chuckled, offering me his arm with a flourish. Shall we? he asked. I took his arm, feeling a thrill of excitement course through my veins as we set off into the crowd together. My heart full to bursting. We made our way to the closest refreshment cart. Ben insisted on buying me a treat, his eyes crinkling at the corners as he watched me deliberate over the array of confections. I'll have a bag of groundnut candy, please, I said at last, my mouth watering at the thought of the sweet treat. Ben grinned, handing over a few coins to the vendor, before presenting me with the bag. A sweet for a sweet, he said, his voice full of warmth. My heart somersault. You're too kind Officer O'Malley, I murmured, taking a delicate bite of the candy and savoring the burst of sweetness on my tongue. On a whim, I held the bag out to Ben, a playful smile, tugging at the corners of my lips. Would you like a taste? I asked, my voice soft and inviting. Ben didn't hesitate. He sampled the candy. My eyes had locked on his full lips, watching them move. My thoughts racing as I contemplated the sweet flavors that lingered there. I imagined leaning in close, my own lips brushing against his in a kiss. My heart pounded in my chest as I struggled to regain my composure. Ben, seemingly oblivious to my turmoil, grinned at me, his eyes sparkling with mischief. Delicious, he declared, his tongue darting out to lick his lips. But not nearly as sweet as the company. Flatterer, I murmured, taking another bite of candy to hide my flustered state. He always seemed to know just what to say to make my heart flutter and my knees go weak. Ben chuckled, his arm tightening around my waist as we continued our stroll through the crowd. It's not flattery if it's the truth, he said, his voice low and full of sincerity. I leaned into his touch, savoring the warmth and strength of his presence, by my side. We wandered through the crowd together, our laughter mingling with the sounds of the bustling crowd as we chatted and joked, the easy camaraderie between us a balm to my lonely soul. With each passing moment, I felt myself falling deeper under Ben's spell, drawn to his warmth and kindness. I also noticed how men moved out of his way as we approached. Even out of uniform, he was a formidable presence. As the hour grew late, we made our way to the edge of the harbor, settling ourselves on a grassy knoll overlooking the shimmering waves. Ben turned to me with a contemplative look in his eyes. Nights like this always make me think of my family. Can I tell you about them? I reached out, my hand finding his in the darkness, our fingers intertwining. I would like that. I sensed the weight of his memories that hung in the air. The moon was just a sliver and almost set, signifying the fireworks would start soon. We had nothing to see by but HT occasional lantern that passed and the stars. The city opted not to light the street lamps until after the show was over. A few years ago, they'd started converting the town to eclectic lights, but the project would take another 10 to 15 years at least. I preferred the gaslights as they were homey and what I'd grown up playing under as a child. Ben sighed, a wistful smile, tugging at the corners of his mouth. It's just me and my younger brother now. Our parents passed away from a lung sickness, leaving us, when we were teenagers, to fend for ourselves in this big, crazy world. My heart ached for him and his younger brother, for the loss and the loneliness that he must have faced at such a young age. I'm so sorry Ben, I whispered, squeezing his hand in a silent gesture of comfort. He shook his head, his eyes meeting mine with a gentle intensity. Don't be, he said, his voice firm and resolute. It was hard, losing them so young, but it made me the man I am today. It taught me the value of family, of holding on to the ones you love with everything you've got. 
his hand tightened on mine, implying that I was one of those people worth holding on to. I prayed that I wasn't falling for a silver tongue, but that Ben was honest in his words and actions, because my heart was too soft to hold it back. What about your brother? I asked, curious to know more about the man who shared Ben's blood and history. What's he like? Ben's face lit up with pride, a grin spreading across his features. Liam's a wild one, he said, chuckling softly. Always has been, ever since we were kids. He's got a restless spirit, always chasing after the next adventure. I smiled, picturing a younger version of Ben, all energy and mischief, running through the streets of Harborview with his brother by his side. Tell me a story about one of your adventures together, I urged, my eyes twinkling with curiosity. Ben laughed, his eyes taking on a faraway look as he delved into his memories. Oh, there are so many to choose from, he said, shaking his head in amusement. But there was this one time, when we were about ten and twelve years old, that really stands out. He settled back against the grass, his arm pulling me closer as he began his tale. It was a hot summer day, and our parents had told us to stay close to home. But Liam, he had this grand idea to go exploring in the woods near the edge of town. He'd heard rumors of an old, abandoned cabin out there, and he was determined to find it. I grinned, already enraptured by the story. And let me guess, you couldn't resist the call to adventure either? Ben chuckled, his eyes sparkling with mirth. You know me too well Margaret. Of course, I couldn't let him go alone. So, we packed a few snacks, grabbed our trusty wooden swords, and set off into the woods. He paused, his expression turning wistful. We must have walked for hours, getting turned around and lost more times than I could count. Liam never lost his enthusiasm. He was like a bloodhound on a scent, determined to find that cabin no matter what. I laughed, picturing the two young boys, all dirt-smudged faces and bright eyes, tramping through the underbrush with their makeshift weapons at the ready. And did you find it? I asked, my voice hushed with anticipation. Ben nodded, a triumphant grin spreading across his face. We did, just as the sun was starting to set. It was a ramshackle old thing, half falling down and covered in vines. But to us, it was a castle, a hidden fortress, just waiting to be claimed. He shook his head, his expression turning rueful. Of course, by the time we got back home, it was well past dark, and our parents were beside themselves with worry. We got the scolding of a lifetime, and I think Liam might have even shed a few tears. But even then, I could see the glint in his eye, the thrill of finding the shack still coursing through his veins. And what adventure has he chased after now? I asked, my eyes twinkling with amusement. Ben gestured out towards the harbor, where the distant silhouette of a ship could be seen against the inky black sky. He's out there, on that ship, he said, his voice filled with a mix of pride and concern. Working as a deckhand, learning the ropes of life on the high seas. I followed his gaze, my eyes widening with recognition. Wait a minute, I said slowly, pieces of a puzzle clicking into place in my mind. Is that the one they're using to launch the fireworks tonight? Ben nodded, his expression curious. You know it? he asked, his eyebrows raised in surprise. I grinned. I know the captain. He's married to one of my dearest friends. I said, my voice warm with affection. He's a good man Ben. One of the best. Ben's shoulders relaxed, a look of relief washing over his features. That's good to hear, he said, his voice sincere. I worry about Liam sometimes. It's a dangerous life, being a sailor. I reached out, my hand finding his cheek in the darkness, my thumb brushing against the rough stubble of his jaw. He's in good hands, I said softly, my eyes locked on his. Captain Nathan will look out for him, keep him safe. He risked his life to save his crew before and I know he would do it again without a thought. Ben leaned into my shoulder. I'm so glad you are here, with me. He ventured a shy look my direction. I felt my lashes flutter. There's nowhere else I'd rather be, I said simply, my voice a soft promise in the night. I looked up, happy to take in the sky. The stars twinkled, a vast expanse of black dotted with pinpricks of light. It's beautiful, isn't it? I murmured, my gaze fixed on the horizon. Ben nodded, his eyes soft and full of wonder. It is, he agreed, his voice barely above a whisper. 
but not nearly as beautiful as the woman beside me. I felt my breath catch. I turned to face him, my eyes searching his for any sign of insincerity or deceit. But all I saw was warmth and affection, a depth of feeling that couldn't be anything but true. Ben, I whispered, my voice trembling with emotion. I... I don't know what to say. He smiled, reaching out to take my hand in his. His fingers were warm and calloused. You don't have to say anything Margaret, he murmured, his voice low and full of tenderness. Just know that I care for you. I swallowed hard, my eyes filling with tears of joy and gratitude. I care for you too Ben, I whispered, my voice barely audible over the pounding of my heart. We sat in silence for a moment, our hands entwined, our hearts beating loudly. And then, as if on cue, the first firework exploded overhead, bathing the night sky in a dazzling array of color and light. I gasped in delight, my eyes wide with wonder as I watched the display unfold before me. The fireworks were a sight to behold, each burst of color more breathtaking than the last. Beside me Ben's eyes reflected the kaleidoscope of hues that danced across the sky. As the fireworks reached their crescendo, I felt a surge of emotion wash over me, a tidal wave of love and longing that threatened to sweep me away. I turned to face Ben, my heart in my throat, my pulse racing with anticipation. And then, as if reading my thoughts, he leaned in close, his breath warm against my ear. Margaret, he whispered, his voice rough with emotion. I would very much like to kiss you. I felt my world tilt on its axis, my heart soaring with joy and exhilaration. Ben, I breathed, my voice barely above a whisper, barely able to nod my permission. With a surge of courage, Ben reached up to cut my cheek with a gentleness that made my heart flutter. His thumb brushed over my skin, a feather, light caress that sent a delicious tingle racing along my nerves. I held my breath as I watched him lean in closer, his eyes soft and tender with emotion. Time itself seemed to hold its breath, each second lingering as we stood on the precipice of a moment that would forever change the course of our lives. When finally his mouth claimed mine, everything else ceased to exist, the universe narrowing down to the exquisite press of his lips against my own, a silent declaration of the feelings that burned between us. It was a kiss filled with restrained passion, a gentle, chaste pressing of lips that nonetheless ignited a warmth deep within my chest. His mouth moved against mine with a tender reverence, a whisper of a touch that promised so much more. I leaned into his embrace, my hands resting lightly on his broad shoulders as I savored the feel of his mouth on mine. The scent of his cologne, the brush of his cheek against my skin, the soft sigh of contentment that escaped his lips, they all combined to create a moment of perfect, stolen intimacy. Ben's hand slid from my cheek to the back of my neck, his fingers tangling gently in the loose curls that had escaped my carefully pinned hair. The gesture was possessive yet tender, a silent declaration of his feelings for me. I poured every ounce of my affection into that kiss, every unspoken word and secret longing. I needed Ben to know, to feel the depth of my growing feelings for him. And as he pulled away, his forehead resting gently against mine as we both struggled to catch our breath, I knew that he understood. The kiss had been a promise, a sweet foretaste of the future we could build together. And as I looked into Ben's eyes, seeing the warmth and devotion that shone there, I knew that I was exactly where I was meant to be. The fireworks continued to explode overhead, a dazzling display of color and light that paled in comparison to the fireworks that erupted in my heart. Chapter 6 The next morning, the cool, crisp air of early morning greeted me as I approached the hat shop, the familiar scent of freshly baked bread wafting from the nearby bakery. The sun was higher in the horizon than it was on a usual day of work, but the whole city seemed to be sleeping off the festivities of the night before and slowly stretching awake. I paused for a moment, breathing in the peaceful stillness of the quiet street, before reaching for the shop's door. Last night was like a dream. I felt safe as Ben walked me home, my arm tucked in his. Not just physically safe, but as if my heart was protected by his strength as well. Elena had arrived long before me, anxious to get started on an order for the upcoming summer wedding season for one of our best customers. No doubt she was in the back room, humming to herself as she worked. As I turned the knob, I noticed an unusual splash of color on the counter inside. Curiosity peaked and I pushed open the door and stepped into the shop, my eyes widening in surprise as I took in the sight before me. There, sitting proudly, was a stunning bouquet of vibrant red roses. The blooms were flawless, each petal a perfect velvet masterpiece that glowed in the soft morning light. 
I approached the bouquet slowly, my heart racing with anticipation as I reached out to gently caress a silky petal. The fragrance of the roses enveloped me, a heady perfume that filled the air with its sweet, intoxicating scent. I closed my eyes for a moment, to just breathe them in. As I opened my eyes, I noticed a small white card nestled among the blooms, my name written in an elegant script across the front. With trembling fingers, I plucked the card from its resting place. To the loveliest hatmaker in all of Harborview, the card read, the word scrawled in Ben's bold, confident hand. May these flowers bring a smile to your face, just as you bring joy to my heart. A giddy smile tugging at my lips. It was a gesture that spoke volumes about Ben's affection for me, a tangible reminder of the feelings that had taken root in both our hearts. I traced my fingers over the ink, imagining Ben sitting at his desk, carefully selecting each word with the same care and attention he gave to other aspects of his life. As I stood there, lost in thought, I heard the sound of footsteps behind me. I turned to see my mother and sister standing in the doorway to the back room, their faces alight with curiosity as they caught sight of me admiring the roses. What a beautiful bouquet! Who could have sent such a lovely gift? Mother feigned innocence and wonder. My blush deepened as I handed her the card, watching as her eyes widened with each word. It's from Ben, I said softly, my voice barely above a whisper. Mother broke into a wide, knowing smile, her eyes twinkling with joy. How wonderful, she said, reaching out to squeeze my hand. He must care for you very deeply, my dear. Elena, who had been bouncing on the balls of her feet with barely contained excitement, let out a squeal of delight. Margaret, she cried, throwing her arms around me in a tight hug. This is so romantic. She bounced, taking me up and down with her. I laughed, hugging her back. Ben and I are taking things slow, enjoying each moment as it comes, I gently warned her off of proclaiming out future wedding and naming our children. But even as I spoke the words, I knew that my heart was already lost to him, that the love I felt for Ben was a once-in-a-lifetime kind of love, the kind that poets wrote about and artists tried to capture on canvas. As I turned back to the roses, inhaling their sweet scent once more, I felt a sense of peace wash over me. That peace stayed with me throughout the day. It was warm and welcoming and something that I hadn't felt in a long time. Later that afternoon, I stood at the counter, my fingers deftly stitching a delicate lace trim onto the brim of a bonnet, lost in thoughts of the previous evening's fireworks and the stolen moment I had shared with Ben. The memory of his kiss still lingered on my lips, a phantom sensation that made my cheeks flush with heat. I had never felt anything like it before, the way his mouth had moved against mine with a passion that bordered on reverence, the way his hands had cradled my face as though I were something precious and fragile. I was so lost in my reverie that I almost didn't hear the sound of the shop door opening, the tinkling of the bell above the frame startling me from my thoughts. I looked up, expecting to see a customer or perhaps my sister Elena, who had stepped out to run an errand. But instead, I found myself face to face with a man I had never seen before, his features so strikingly similar to Ben's that I knew instantly who he must be. Liam? I asked, my voice tinged with surprise and delight. Liam O'Malley? The man grinned, his blue eyes sparkling with mischief and charm. The one and only, he said, sweeping into a low bow that made me giggle, despite myself. And you must be the famous Margaret Sullivan, the woman who's managed to sweep my hard-nosed brother off his feet. My heart skipped a beat at the thought of Ben speaking about me to his brother. I don't know about famous, I demurred, setting aside my project and coming around the counter to greet him properly. But it's a pleasure to meet you, Liam. Ben has told me so much about you. Liam took my hand in his, his grip strong and calloused from years of working on ships. All good things, I hope, he said, his voice laced with good humor. Though knowing my brother, he probably made me out to be some kind of scoundrel or any or do well. I laughed, shaking my head. On the contrary, I assured him. He spoke of you with great affection and pride. Something softened in Liam's expression at my words making him seem younger, more like the boy he must have been growing up alongside Ben. He means the world to me, he said quietly, his voice rough with emotion. Which is why I had to come and meet the woman who's captured his heart so completely. I'm honored, I said softly, squeezing his hand even while I noted his bold proclamations on behalf of his older brother. I didn't put too much stock in his words as Elena would have done the same for me. Liam grinned, the moment of seriousness passing as quickly as it had come. Even my captain vouched for your character. 
I felt a flicker of surprise at his words, my brow furrowing in confusion. You spoke to Captain Nathan about me? Liam chuckled, releasing my hand and leaning against the counter with a casual grace that reminded me so much of his brother. He's a crafty old sea dog, that one, he said, his voice filled with affection. Always seems to know just what strings to pull to make things happen. I nodded, feeling a rush of gratitude for the friendship and support of people like Captain Nathan and Alice. I'm lucky to have such good friends, I said softly, my heart swelling with emotion. I remembered the part Liam played in the fireworks display the night before. Brightening, I asked, how did your night go? No mishaps aboard ship I hope. Not a one, Liam said, his eyes twinkling with mischief, though I hear you two had quite the evening. My heart skipping a beat at the memory of the way Ben's lips had moved against mine with a passion that had left me breathless and aching for more. It was, it was wonderful, I said softly, my voice barely above a whisper. Liam laughed. You do it too. What? I asked, pressing my cool fingers to my warm cheeks. Light up when you talk about him. He frowned. It's rather annoying. Laughing, I shoved his arm. Stop teasing me, or I won't give you any of the cookies from the back room. He instantly sobered. My deepest apologies, Mississippi. I laughed at his mock sincerity. Liam smiled, his eyes softening with kind affection. He liked me. And I liked him. Feeling as though we'd come to an understanding, we chatted for a few moments longer. He took his leave, a bag of my mother's freshly baked cookies clutched in his hand and a promise to visit again soon. I marveled at the happenings in my life and I began to hum, unable to keep all that happy inside. Chapter 7 The days following Liam's visit passed in a whirlwind of joy and excitement, each moment spent in Ben's company deepening the bond that had blossomed between us. Ben's gifts continued to arrive, each one more thoughtful and heartfelt than the last. A box of rich, decadent chocolates, each morsel a burst of flavor on my tongue. A small, leather-bound journal, its pages waiting to be filled with my thoughts and dreams. His visits to the hat shop became part of his daily route through the city that I looked forward to with eager anticipation. I would hear the familiar sound of his footsteps outside the shop, the steady rhythm of his boots against the cobblestones sending a thrill of excitement through my veins. He would enter with a a twinkle in his eye, his presence filling the room with a warmth and vitality that made my heart sing. I'd close the shop and he'd walk me home his eyes ever glancing about for danger. We would talk and laugh, sharing stories of our days and our dreams for the future. Ben would regale me with tales of his adventures on the streets of Harborview, his voice filled with a mixture of pride and humility as he spoke of the people he had helped and the criminals he had brought to justice. I listened with rapt attention, my heart swelling with admiration for the bravery and dedication he displayed in his work. In turn, I shared my own stories, telling him of the hats I had created and the customers I had served, the small triumphs and challenges that made up the fabric of my days. Ben absorbed every word making me feel important if not at the world at least to him. As the weeks passed, the love between us became a tangible, living thing that filled every corner of my heart. On his nights off Ben would take me to the seashore, the salt-tinged air and the crash of the waves against the rocks a beautiful background. We would walk hand in hand, our feet sinking into the cool, damp sand as we searched for shells and sea glass. As the sun began to set, painting the sky in a breathtaking array of pinks and oranges, we would sit together on the rocks, our shoulders touching as we watched the day slip into night. Ben would wrap his arm around me, pulling me close, and I would lean into his warmth, my head resting on his shoulder. It was during those moments, with the sound of the waves crashing against the shore and the stars twinkling overhead, that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had found my soulmate. Ben was everything I had ever wanted, everything I had ever needed, and I knew that I would love him until my dying day. One afternoon, as I made my way through the bustling streets, my arms laden with packages and my mind full of Ben, I caught sight of him sitting on a bench in the park, deep in conversation with his brother Liam. My heart leapt with excitement at the sight of them together. Liam had been on a longer voyage, and Ben missed him terribly. I quickened my pace, eager to share in their laughter and camaraderie. As I drew closer, I realized that their conversation was not the light-hearted banter I expected. Their expressions were grave as they spoke. I slowed my steps, suddenly unsure if I should intrude on their private moment. And then I heard my name, spoken in Ben's deep, familiar voice, and I felt my heart stutter in my chest. 
I shouldn't eavesdrop, but something in the tone of his voice, in the tension that radiated from his body, made me pause, my feet rooted to the spot as I strained to hear their words. I just don't know if it's fair, Ben said, his voice heavy with concern. To ask a woman to endure the constant fear and uncertainty that comes with being married to a police officer. The long hours, the danger, the never knowing if I'll come home at the end of the day. I felt my heart sink at his words, a cold, heavy weight settling in the pit of my stomach. Was this what he truly thought? That I was too weak, too fragile to handle the realities of his life? That I couldn't be the partner he needed, the rock he could lean on in times of trouble and strife? I wanted to rush to his side, to take him in my arms and assure him that I was stronger than he knew, that I would stand by him through anything and everything that life could throw our way. But a sense of hurt and anger held me back. Ben, you can't think like that, Liam said, his voice gentle, but firm. Margaret is a strong woman, a fighter. She's been through her own share of heartache and struggle, and she's come out the other side a good-hearted person. She loves you, with every fiber of her being. And she would walk through fire for you, just as you would for her. Liam. Blessed Liam. I suddenly wanted to bake him ten dozen cookies. A loyalty to him, the deep familial kind that usually took a childhood to build blossomed in an instant. But even as Liam's words washed over me like a soothing balm, I couldn't shake the sense of hurt and betrayal that had sliced my heart. How could Ben doubt me, doubt us? How could he question the strength of my love, the depth of my commitment to him and to our future together? Tears pricked at the corners of my eyes, hot and stinging, and I blinked them back furiously, refusing to let them fall. I wouldn't cry, not here, not now. With a heavy heart and a mind full of tumultuous thoughts, I turned away from the bench where, my feet carrying me back towards the hat shop and the sanctuary of my work. I needed time to think, to process the overheard conversation and the doubts that now plagued my mind. As I walked, the sounds of the city faded into the background, replaced by the rush of blood in my ears. I felt as though I was moving through a fog, my surroundings blurred and indistinct as I grappled with the realization that the man I loved might not have the same faith in me that I had in him. It was a painful truth to confront, a reality that threatened to shatter the fragile bubble of happiness we had built together. I couldn't ignore it, couldn't pretend that everything was fine. I needed to make him see that I was not some delicate flower to be protected and sheltered, but a woman of strength and resilience, a partner who could stand by his side through thick and thin. But even as I resolved to have that conversation, to lay my heart bare and demand the truth from the man I loved, a whisper of doubt that made my heart clench with dread. What if he decided that the risks were too great, the obstacles too insurmountable? What if he left me, his love not strong enough to weather the storms that lay ahead? The thought was almost too painful to bear, and a sob rose up in my throat, threatening to choke me with its intensity. I swallowed it back, blinking away the tears that blurred my vision as I hurried through the streets, my mind racing with a whirlwind of emotions even as one thought rose to the surface. I loved him, with every fiber of my being, with every beat of my heart. I would fight for that love, with every ounce of strength and determination I possessed. I would stand by his side, through good times and bad, through sickness and health, through all the joys and sorrows that life had to offer. And if he couldn't see that, couldn't believe in the power of our love to conquer any obstacle, then perhaps he wasn't the man I had thought he was. Perhaps our love wasn't as strong or as true as I had believed. Chapter 8 I stood before the mirror carefully pinning the final touches to my hair, when Ben knocked on the door. My heart leapt in my chest. Ben had asked me out for a posh dinner at the esteemed Parker House Hotel. His invitation was so unexpected after the conversation I'd overheard in the park that my brain stuttered over how to bridge the two. He'd taken my inability to form words as surprise, kissed my cheek, and told me he'd be over at six to pick me up. I took a deep breath, trying to calm the nerves that fluttered in my stomach, and made my way to the door. I opened it, not sure what to expect. His eyes sparkled with warmth and affection as he took in the sight of me, a smile tugging at the corners of his lips. Nothing in his countenance spoke of his concerns about asking me to be his wife and everything leaned toward the love I believed we shared. You look beautiful Margaret, he said softly, his voice melting me all over. I forced a smile in return, hoping that he couldn't see the worry that lurked beneath the surface. Perhaps tonight was meant to be a happy one, a fancy dinner shared under a crystal chandelier. But I couldn't bring myself to broach the subject of our future together, not yet. 
Tonight was one of the rare opportunities to spend time together away from the chaos and demands of our daily lives. So I pushed my concerns aside, determined to enjoy the evening and the company of the man I loved. We made our way through the bustling streets of Harborview, the evening air whispering against my skin that summer and all its heat was just around the corner. The Parker House Hotel came into view and I couldn't help but marvel at its grandeur. The building was a marvel of Italian-style architecture, its facade adorned with gleaming windows that seemed to beckon us inside. We entered through the main doors, and I felt my breath catch in my throat at the opulence that surrounded us. The foyer was a vision of elegance, with polished marble floors and a grand staircase that swept upwards. The air was filled with the soft strains of music from string instruments and the gentle tinkling of glasses and the murmur of conversation from the other guests. As we made our way towards the restaurant, I couldn't help be in awe at the sheer luxury of our surroundings. The Parker House was renowned for its exquisite cuisine and impeccable service, and I knew that tonight would be a dining experience unlike any other. The maitre d' greeted us with a bow, his eyes sparkling with recognition as he took in the sight of Ben in his finest attire. Officer O'Malley, he said, his voice warm with respect. It's an honor to have you dining with us this evening. Please, allow me to show you to your table. We followed him through the dining room, weaving between the tables draped in crisp white linens and adorned with gleaming silverware. The other diners' conversations and laughter blending into a soft hum. When we reached our table, nestled in a quiet corner of the room, the maitre d' pulled out my chair with a flourish, his eyes dancing. I settled into my chair, drinking in the sight of Ben across the table. He looked so handsome in the soft glow of the candlelight, his features relaxed and his eyes shining with happiness. Even as I basked in his presence, I couldn't shake the nagging sense of unease in my heart. I wanted to ask him his meeting with Liam in the park, but something held me back, a fear of shattering the fragile peace of the evening, of losing the man I loved. So I smiled and laughed and sipped my drink, determined to enjoy the moment and push my worries aside. We dined on sumptuous dishes and lost ourselves in conversation. Just as we were about to try the new pie created by the chef, they were calling it Boston cream pie and I'd heard so many wonderful things about it that I could hardly wait to sample it, a familiar voice interrupted our conversation. Well, 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 if it isn't Officer O'Malley and his lovely lady friend, said a man with salt and pepper hair and a friendly face. I recognized him instantly as one of the men who had teased Ben when I brought scones to the police station. He stood with his arm around a woman who appeared to be his wife, her eyes twinkling with mirth as she took in the sight of us together. They made a handsome couple, both dressed in their finest attire for an evening out on the town. Ben stood to greet them, his hand outstretched in a warm handshake. Officer Patterson, Mrs. Patterson, what a pleasant surprise, he said, his voice filled with genuine affection. I didn't expect to see you here tonight. Officer Patterson chuckled, his eyes crinkling at the corners as he clapped Ben on the shoulder. Well, the missus and I decided to treat ourselves, he said, his voice brimming with good humor. And what better place to do it than the Parker House, eh? His wife nodded, her smile widening as she turned her attention to me. And who is this lovely young lady Officer O'Malley, she asked, her voice warm and inviting. I don't believe we've had the pleasure of meeting. Ben smiled, his eyes shining with pride as he gestured to me. Allow me to introduce Miss Margaret Sullivan, he said, his voice filled with tenderness. The most brilliant and beautiful hatmaker in all of Harborview, and the woman who has stolen my heart. My heart swelled with love and affection for this man. It's a pleasure to meet you both, I said, my voice soft and sincere. Ben has spoken so highly of you, Officer Patterson. I feel as though I know you already. The older man chuckled. Well, I hope he hasn't been telling you too many stories about our adventures, he said, his voice laced with good humor. I wouldn't want to ruin my reputation as a respectable officer of the law. We all laughed, the sound ringing out through the dining room and drawing the attention of the other patrons. For a moment, I forgot all about my worries and fears, lost in the warmth and camaraderie of those who served together. Did you hear about Officer Jenkins? The man asked, his voice low and somber as he leaned in close to Ben's ear. Run down by a wagon on his daily route. Broke both his legs, they say. He'll be lucky if he ever walks again. Jenkins? I asked. Mrs. Patterson pressed her hand to her throat. A younger officer. Redhead? Such a sweet young man. 
I blanched as the chubby-cheeked ginger who had stood close to Officer Patterson on that same day I'd met him came to mind. My hand flew to my mouth in shock. He was so young to face such a hardship. Ben's jaw tightened, his hand clenching into a fist as he absorbed the news. I reached out, my fingers brushing against his in a gentle, reassuring touch, but he pulled away, his gaze distant and troubled. That's terrible news, he murmured, his voice heavy with emotion. Jenkins is a good man, a fine officer. He doesn't deserve this. Officer Patterson nodded, his expression grim. It's a dangerous job Ben. One wrong move, one moment of inattention, and it could be any one of us lying in that hospital bed. Mrs. Patterson looped her hand through his arm, her face stoic. Come dear, we should let them get to that delicious pie. She leaned toward me, it's to die for. She was sweet to move the conversation to less grim topics. I smiled though the gesture didn't reach my soul. The couple left and Ben sat back down to finish our dessert. My appetite and excitement over the creamy display on my plate was gone. Ben said nothing, his eyes fixed on some distant point beyond the restaurant's walls. I could see the wheels turning in his head, the weight of responsibility and fear that bore down on his shoulders like a physical burden. The rest of the evening passed in a haze of stilted conversation and heavy silences, the easy conversation of earlier replaced by a tension that hung thick in the air between us. When Ben dropped me off at home, his kiss was brief and distracted, his mind clearly elsewhere as he bid me good night. I shut the door and leaned against it, my heart in my throat. Chapter 9 The bell above the hat shop door jangled violently, startling me from my reverie. I looked up from the delicate lace trim I had been stitching, my heart leaping into my throat at the sight of Tabitha's ashen face. Her usually rosy cheeks, so jolly when teaching her students, were drained of color, and her bright blue eyes were wide with terror. She clutched her handbag tightly to her chest, as if it were a lifeline in the midst of a raging storm. Margaret, she cried, her voice trembling with fear and urgency. Her words tumbled out in a frantic rush, each syllable laced with dread. There's a dangerous criminal on the loose, and the entire police force is out searching for him. The hat shop suddenly felt claustrophobic, the walls closing in around us as the weight of Tabitha's words settled heavily in the air. The once cheerful atmosphere, filled with the gentle rustling of fabric and the soft chatter of customers, had been replaced by a suffocating silence, broken only by the pounding of my own heart. A cold knot of dread tightened in my stomach, my mind immediately racing to thoughts of Ben. He would be at the forefront of the manhunt, putting himself in harm's way to protect the people of Harborview. What happened? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper, the words struggling to pass through my constricted throat. My tongue felt thick and heavy in my mouth, as if it were coated in the same dread that now coursed through my veins. How did he escape? Tabitha shook her head, her chestnut curls bobbing with emotion, as her eyes remained wide with terror. They were transferring him to a different facility when he managed to overpower the guards and slip away. Her words came in short, clipped bursts, as if each syllable required a tremendous effort to pronounce. He's known for his ruthlessness. The police are warning everyone to stay inside and lock their doors until he's caught. The gravity of the situation hung in the air between us, a palpable force that seemed to suck the very life from the room. The once comforting scent of new fabric and fresh flowers now took on a cloying, almost sickening quality, as if the very essence of the shop had been tainted by the news of the criminal's escape. I swallowed hard, my heart pounding in my chest as I imagined Ben out there on the streets, facing this dangerous fugitive head-on. The thought of him in danger, of something happening to him because of his duty, made my blood run cold. I have to make sure he's all right, I said, my voice shaking with fear and determination. Tabitha reached out and grasped my hand, her fingers cold and clammy against my skin. Margaret, no, she pleaded, her eyes filled with concern. It's too dangerous. The best thing you can do is stay here where it's safe and wait for news. I shook my head, though I knew she was right. The thought of staying locked inside while Ben risked his life on the streets was unbearable, but I couldn't let my fears cloud my judgment. Tabitha, sensing my distress, placed a comforting hand on my shoulder. Why don't I make us some tea, she offered, her voice soft and soothing. It might help calm our nerves. I nodded gratefully, managing a weak smile as Tabitha disappeared into the back room to heat the kettle. 
The familiar ritual of tea-making provided a small measure of comfort in the midst of the chaos. As I tried to focus on the simple task of tidying up the shop, my mind kept drifting to Ben and the dangers he faced. The minutes seemed to stretch into hours as I waited for Tabitha to return, my heart racing with every passing moment. Suddenly, the bell above the door jangled once more, its shrill sound cutting through the tense atmosphere like a knife. I turned to see Liam's familiar figure stumble into the shop, his movements clumsy and erratic, as if he were being pursued by some unseen force. His youthful face etched with lines of worry and despair, his eyes wide with fear. His normally well, groomed appearance was disheveled, his sandy hair standing on end and his clothes rumpled and stained with sweat. Margaret, he cried. Thank God I found you. His words carried a weight of desperation, as if he had been searching for me with a singular focus, his entire being consumed by the need to deliver his message. My heart stopped, my breath catching in my throat as I saw the anguish in his eyes, a depth of pain that I had never before witnessed. What happened? I whispered, my voice trembling with fear, each word feeling like shards of glass in my mouth. Is he? I couldn't bring myself to finish the question, the mere thought of losing Ben was too horrific to contemplate. Liam shook his head, his expression grim. He's been injured. Shot by the fugitive during the operation to capture him. His words fell like hammer blows, each one driving the reality of the situation deeper into my soul. They've taken him to the hospital, but it's bad. Really bad. His voice cracked on the final words, as if saying them aloud made them more real, more inescapable. I felt the world tilt on its axis, my knees buckling beneath me as the reality of his words sank in, the floor swayed and pitched like a ship on a stormy sea. Ben, my brave, strong, wonderful Ben, was lying in a hospital bed, his life hanging in the balance, his future uncertain. The thought of losing him, of never again seeing his crooked smile or feeling the warmth of his embrace, was too much to bear, a weight that threatened to crush me entirely. Liam's words echoed in my mind, each syllable a painful reminder of the dire situation we found ourselves in. The world around me seemed to fade away, the once familiar surroundings of the hat shop now foreign and distant, as if I were viewing them through a veil of tears. I felt a chill seep into my bones, a coldness that had nothing to do with the temperature of the room, but rather a deep-seated fear that threatened to consume me entirely. Tabitha emerged from the back room, a steaming kettle in one hand and a soft, woolen shawl draped over her arm. She took one look at my ashen face and Liam's haunted expression, and her eyes widened with understanding. Without a word, she set the kettle down and quickly draped the shawl around my trembling shoulders. Even though it was the cusp of summer, I took the shawl gratefully, clutching it tightly around myself as if it were a shield against the horrors that awaited me. Liam stepped forward, his hands gentle as he helped me adjust the shawl, his touch a small but much-needed comfort in the midst of the chaos. I looked up at him, my eyes searching his face for any sign of hope, any glimmer of reassurance that everything would be all right. But his expression was grim, his jaw set with determination as he met my gaze. I took a deep, shuddering breath, steeling myself for what was to come. I knew that I had to be strong, not just for myself, but for Ben, who needed me now more than ever. Take me to him, I said, my voice barely above a whisper, each word a struggle, to produce. Please, Liam. I need to be with him. Liam nodded, his expression softening with understanding, a flicker of empathy passing across his features. Of course, he said, taking my arm and leading me through the crowded streets, his grip firm and reassuring. He'll want you there Margaret. He needs you now more than ever. We hurried through the city to the hospital. Each step felt like an eternity, each passing second a torturous reminder of the precious time we were losing. As we dodged carriages and pushcarts, a sense of dread washed over me, a fear that we might be too late, that Ben might slip away before I had a chance to see him one last time. But I pushed those thoughts aside, clinging to the hope that he would pull through, that our love would be enough to bring him back from the brink. The hospital corridors were crowded with people, the air thick with the scent of antiseptic and the sound of muffled sobs. Nurses and doctors rushed to and fro, their faces etched with grim determination as they tended to the wounded and sick. Liam led me through the maze, his hand firm and reassuring on my arm. When we finally reached Ben's room, my heart constricted with fear and dread. I took a deep, shuddering breath. I pushed open the door and stepped inside, my eyes immediately falling on the still, battered form of the man I loved. Ben lay on the hospital bed, his face pale and drawn, his body covered in bandages. 
The sight of him, so strong and vital, reduced to this fragile, broken shell, was almost more than I could bear. I moved to his side, my hand reaching out to gently stroke his brow. His skin was cold and clammy beneath my fingers, his breathing shallow and labored. I felt tears prick at the corners of my eyes, my heart breaking with each ragged breath he took. Ben, I whispered, my voice thick with emotion. I'm here, my love. I'm here. His eyes fluttered open at the sound of my voice, his gaze hazy and unfocused. Margaret, he croaked, his voice barely above a whisper. What are you doing here? I swallowed hard, my throat tight with unshed tears. I had to come Ben. I had to be with you. I said softly, my hand still stroking his brow. He closed his eyes, a grimace of pain crossing his features as he tried to sit up. My hands were gentle, but firm as I eased him back against the pillows. Easy, I murmured, my voice soothing. Don't try to move too much. You need to rest. He nodded, his jaw clenched tight with pain. We had him cornered, but he was armed, he said, his voice strained. He got off a shot before we could take him down. A shudder ran through me at his words, my mind reeling with the thought of how close I had come to losing him. I'm so grateful you're alive, I whispered, my voice breaking with emotion. When Liam told me what happened, I thought. Ben reached out and took my hand, his fingers weak and trembling in mine. I'm sorry Margaret, he said softly, his eyes filled with anguish. I never meant to put you through this. I never meant to cause you pain. I shook my head, my tears finally spilling over and running down my cheeks. Don't apologize, I said fiercely, my voice thick with emotion. You were doing your duty, Ben. You were being the brave, selfless man I fell in love with. He closed his eyes, a tear slipping from beneath his lashes and running down his pale cheek. That's just it Margaret, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. I can't keep doing this to you. I can't put you through this every time I go out on a case. I felt my heart sink at his words, a cold knot of dread forming in the pit of my stomach. What are you saying Ben? I asked, my voice trembling with fears I thought I'd buried and left behind. He took a deep, shuddering breath, his eyes meeting mine with a look of anguish and despair. I'm saying that I can't be with you anymore Margaret. My breath left my body in a rush of pain and disbelief. No, I whispered, my voice breaking with emotion. No Ben, you can't mean that. You can't just give up on us, on what we have together. He shook his head, his eyes filled with a deep, aching sadness. I'm sorry Margaret, he said softly, his voice thick with emotion. But I have to do what's best for you, even if it breaks my heart to do it. I see can't give you the life you deserve. Not as long as I wear the badge. I felt a sob rise up in my throat, my heart shattering into a million pieces at his words. How could he say such things, how could he even think of leaving me? I wanted to scream, to rage against the unfairness of it all. I wanted to take him in my arms and never let go, to show him with every touch and every kiss just how much I loved him, how deeply I was committed to our life together. He slipped into unconsciousness, and I buried my face in his neck and cried. Chapter 10 I cried for a moment, letting the fears and de the feelings release into a puddle on the bedsheet. The gaslight flickered, casting shifting shadows across the stark white walls of the hospital room, and for a moment, the weight of our uncertain future was suffocating. He didn't mean it, Liam offered from the doorway where he stood as sentinel. He's in pain, and he's babbling. I sniffed and used the edge of my shawl to wipe my cheeks. He meant it. I know he did, Liam. But it's okay. My heart clenched painfully at Ben's words, the weight of his fears and doubts settling heavily in my chest. The air felt thick with the unspoken implications of his declaration, the reality of the dangers he faced every day as a police officer in Harborview. The room seemed to shrink around us. Ben stirred beneath me, his eyes fluttering open. Margaret, he rasped. See, Liam said hopefully. He doesn't know what he's saying. I thought I told you to leave. Ben said. I lifted one eyebrow at Liam. He had the decency to duck his head, embarrassed. I appreciated his efforts to soothe my heart, though. He was a good man and only doing what he thought best for his older brother. You shouldn't be here. 
Ben shifted, his face covered in a mask of pain. A fierce determination rose within me, a resolve to stand by Ben's side no matter the challenges we might face. I refused to let his noble intentions push me away, to allow the specter of an uncertain future to rob us of the love we shared. Leaning forward, I silenced his protests with a tender kiss, my lips gentle yet insistent against his own. The rough stubble of his unshaven face rasped against my skin. I poured all my love and devotion into the simple gesture, willing him to feel the depth of my commitment, the unshakable faith I had in our bond. As I pulled back, tears glistened in my eyes, catching the flickering light of the gas lamps that cast a warm glow throughout the room. I'm here Ben, I whisper fiercely, my voice thick with emotion. I'm not going anywhere. You don't get to make choices for me, and you certainly don't get to stop me from loving you. My words hang in the air between us, a declaration of love and defiance in the face of an uncertain future. Ben's eyes search mine, the piercing blue depths swirling with a mixture of fear, love, and a desperate longing to believe in the strength of our bond. The tender moment was suddenly interrupted by a low chuckle from the doorway. Looks like you found a woman more stubborn than you, big brother, Liam Tease, his deep voice tinged with affection and amusement. Ben grimaced in response, though whether from pain or the weight of Liam's pronouncement, I couldn't quite tell. The air in the room charged with a mixture of emotions, love, fear, determination, and the unbreakable bonds of family. Before Ben could respond to either of us, a flurry of doctors and nurses rushed into the room, ready to whisk him away for surgery. Liam and I were ushered out, left to wait and hope and pray. We found a worn wooden bench in the dimly lit hallway, the varnish faded and chipped from years of use. The muffled sounds of the hospital, the distant cries of patients, the hurried footsteps of nurses, and the clattering of metal instruments, never leave us as Liam and I lean into each other, seeking comfort in the familiar presence of family. Liam's arm, strong and reassuring, draped around my shoulders. The simple, brotherly gesture feels like a lifeline, anchoring me amidst the swirling uncertainty and fear that threatens to consume me. His solid presence helps to calm the frantic racing of my heart, the warmth of his body chasing away the chill that settled deep in my bones. I've never had a sister before, Liam mused, his voice contemplative, breaking the heavy silence that hung between us. The gaslight flickers overhead, casting dancing shadows across his face, highlighting the worry lines etched into his forehead. A soft chuckle escaped my lips, the sound foreign and almost jarring in the somber atmosphere of the hospital corridor. And I've never had a brother, I replied, my voice barely above a whisper. Liam was quiet for a moment, his gaze fixed on the scuffed wooden floorboards beneath our feet. The silence stretches between us, filled with unspoken fears and hopes, until he suddenly asks, did you bring cookies? The unexpected question startled a laugh from me, the sound bubbling up from some hidden well of strength I didn't know I possessed. I turned slightly, my elbow jabbing playfully into Liam's ribs as I replied, when Ben and I set up house, I promise to make you cookies once a week. His eyebrows rose, a glimmer of hope sparking, momentarily replacing the shadows of concern. Promise, he asks, his voice tinged with a childlike eagerness that belies the gravity of our situation. Cross my heart, I declare solemnly, the words of vow not just to Liam, but to myself, a promise to hold on to hope, to believe in the future that Ben and I have dreamed of building together. Liam's arm tightened around me, drawing me closer into his comforting embrace. Thank you for being here Margaret, he murmurs, his voice thick with emotion. I don't want to be alone. My heart swells with love for both O'Malley men, a fierce protectiveness surging through my veins. I close my eyes, sending a silent, fervent prayer heavenward, pleading for Ben to make it through the surgery, to come back to us whole and strong. The yearning to build a life with him, to create a home filled with love, laughter, and the sweet aroma of freshly baked cookies, is a palpable ache in my chest. As the hours drag on, the ticking of the grandfather clock in the corner of the waiting room becomes a mocking reminder of the uncertainty that gnaws at my gut. Thoughts swirl in my mind like a raging tempest, fear and longing intertwined in a dizzying dance. Will Ben survive? Will I ever have the chance to tell him how much he means to me, to promise him forever in front of God and our loved ones? The questions remain unanswered, lingering in the air like specters as we kept our vigil, clinging to each other and to the fragile threads of hope that bound us together. Chapter 11 I took a deep breath, my neck sore and stiff as I awakened on the couch in Ben's small parlor room. The faint scent of freshly brewed coffee wafted through the air, mingling with the lingering aroma of the medicinal salves I had used to tend to Ben's wounds the night before. 
It had been three days since Ben was released from the hospital into my care, and though the journey had been arduous, I was grateful to be away from the nurses and doctors and the hospital bustle, where I could watch over his recovery. Sunlight filtered through the curtains, casting intricate patterns on the worn floorboards as I made my way to the kitchen. On the counter, I found a note from Liam, his hasty scrawl informing me that he had risen early to make coffee before setting off to sail with Captain Nathan for the day. I smiled softly to myself, appreciating the brotherly bond between Liam and Ben, and the way they supported each other through thick and thin and the way that Liam had included me in that circle. With renewed determination, I set about preparing a hearty breakfast, hoping to lift Ben's spirits and nourish his healing body. The sizzle of bacon and the comforting aroma of fresh biscuits filled the kitchen. Arranging the food on a tray, I made my way to Ben's room, balancing the laden dish carefully as I nudged the door open with my hip. The sight that greeted me made my heart swell with a mixture of love and relief. Ben sat propped up in bed, a tired but determined look in his piercing blue eyes. Though his skin was still pale, there was a glimmer of his usual strength and vitality in his gaze. Good morning, my love, I said softly, setting the tray on his lap, before taking a seat beside him on the bed. The mattress dipped under my weight, and I relished the closeness, the warmth of his body seeping into mine. Ben's hand found mine, his calloused fingers lacing through my own as he fixed me with a look that made my breath catch in my throat. The depth of emotion swirling in his piercing blue eyes was both captivating and unnerving, a testament to the profound connection we shared. The morning light filtering through the lace curtains cast a soft glow across his features, highlighting the faint lines of worry and exhaustion that lingered on his face. We'd avoided having deep talks about our future together, both of us perhaps afraid to voice the hopes and fears that lay hidden in our hearts. But something in his look, a flicker of determination mingled with vulnerability, told me that we were headed in that direction. The air between us crackled with unspoken words, the weight of the conversation we'd been putting off for too long. I hadn't forgotten how he'd tried to break things off with me before his surgery, the memory of his desperate attempt to push me away still fresh in my mind. The pain of that moment, the fear of losing him forever, had been a constant companion during those long hours in the hospital waiting room. Even as I sat by his bedside, tending to his wounds and offering words of comfort, a small, insidious part of me couldn't help but wonder if he truly wanted me there, if he still harbored doubts about our future together. But I'd been able to focus instead on the immediate task of nursing him back to health. Our days were filled with changing bandages, preparing nourishing meals, and reading to him from his favorite books. Ben, for his part, had been a model patient, grateful for my care and attentive to my needs, but he hadn't brought up the subject of our relationship, perhaps sensing my reluctance to delve into those murky waters. Now, as we sat together in the quiet of his bedroom, the sunlight casting dappled patterns on the worn quilt, it seemed our time for respite had run out. The unspoken words that had hung between us, the doubts and fears and hopes that we'd kept locked away, were clamoring to be heard, to be acknowledged and addressed. Margaret, he began, his voice rough with emotion, the sound of my name on his lips sending a shiver down my spine. I remember your stubbornness before I went into surgery. The way you refused to let me push you away, even when I thought I was doing what was best for you. I swallowed hard, my throat suddenly tight with emotion as I met his gaze, the intensity of his stare boring into my very soul. I squeezed his hand. You were trying to protect me Ben. I know that. A rueful smile tugged at the corners of his mouth, and he ducked his head, a faint blush coloring his cheeks. I was a coward Margaret. I thought I was being brave by pushing you away, but in truth, I was running from my own fears. I was so afraid of being the cause of your pain, that I nearly lost the most precious thing in my life. Tears pricked my eyes, and I reached out to cup his face, my thumb tracing the curve of his cheekbone. You could never lose me Ben. My heart is yours, now and forever. He leaned into my touch, his eyes fluttering, closed for a moment as he savored the connection between us. When he spoke again, his voice was filled with a quiet intensity. I love you Margaret Sullivan. More than I ever thought possible. You've shown me what it means to love with every fiber of my being. A watery chuckle escaped my lips, and I shook my head in wonder. It's a good thing one of us has a good head on their shoulders, then. Imagine the trouble we'd get into if we were both as reckless as you officer. Oh Mally. The sound of his laughter, rich and warm, filled the room and my own heart soared in response. This was the Ben I knew and loved, the man who could find joy and humor even in the darkest of times. 
As our laughter faded Ben's expression grew serious once more, his gaze locking onto mine with a fierce intensity. I've let my fears and doubts cloud my judgment, and I pushed you away when I should have held you closer. But I promise you, from this day forward, I will never again make the mistake of underestimating your strength, your courage, or your love. Tears spilled down my cheeks, and I made no move to wipe them away. Let them fall, let them be a testament to the depth of my love for this remarkable man. And I promise you Ben, that I will always be by your side, no matter what challenges we face. Together, we can weather any storm. With a determined smile, Ben reached into his nightstand, his hand trembling slightly as he retrieved a small velvet box. My heart stuttered in my chest as he opened the lid, revealing a sparkling gold ring that glinted in the morning light. Margaret Sullivan, he said, his voice thick with emotion, I know I'm not a perfect man. I have my flaws and my fears, but I also have a love for you that knows no bounds. Will you do me the honor of becoming my wife, my partner in all things, for now and forever? A sob caught in my throat, and for a moment, I couldn't speak. The love I felt for this man, this brave, stubborn, wonderful man, threatened to overwhelm me, to sweep me away on a tide of pure, unadulterated joy. Yes, I whispered, my voice trembling with the force of my emotions. Yes Ben, I will marry you. With shaking hands, he slipped the ring onto my finger, the cool metal warming against my skin as a symbol of our unbreakable bond. He leaned forward, capturing my lips in a kiss that spoke of love, of devotion, and of the unshakable faith we had in each other. As we broke apart, breathless and giddy with happiness, I rested my forehead against his, our tears mingling as we basked in the sheer perfection of the moment. I love you Ben O'Malley, I murmured, my lips brushing against his with each word. Forever and always. And I love you Margaret Sullivan, he replied, his voice filled with a reverence that made my heart skip a beat. My stubborn, beautiful, incredible wife-to-be. As the morning light cast a golden glow over our entwined forms, I closed my eyes and sent up a silent prayer of thanks. Thanks for the love that had found me, for the strength that had sustained me, and for the incredible man who had found my heart and given me his in return. And as Ben's lips found mine once more, sealing our engagement with a kiss that set my soul ablaze, I knew that no matter what the future held, we would face it together. Two hearts, two souls, bound by a love that would endure through every trial and triumph, every joy and sorrow, for all the days of our lives. Chapter 12 As I slipped into my wedding gown, the delicate lace and silk caressing my skin like a whisper, I caught my reflection in the mirror and felt my breath catch in my throat. The woman staring back at me was a vision of ethereal beauty, her chestnut hair swept up in an elegant chignon, tendrils framing her face like wisps of smoke. The gown, a masterpiece of intricate lace and shimmering pearls, hugged my curves before cascading to the floor in a sea of ivory. I took a moment to admire the dress, my fingers tracing the delicate details that I had spent countless hours stitching into the fabric. Each stitch was a labor of love, a testament to the unwavering devotion I felt for the man waiting for me at the altar. The gown was more than just a garment, it was a symbol of our love. A surge of emotion washed over me. Memories of the past few months flooded my mind, the stolen glances, the tender moments, the whispered promises that had led us to this day. I thought of the trials we had faced, the obstacles we had overcome, and the unwavering love that had sustained us through it all. A knock at the door startled me from my reverie, and I turned to see my mother standing in the doorway, her eyes glistening. She looked resplendent in a gown of pale lavender, her silver hair swept up in an elegant twist. Oh Margaret, she breathed, her voice trembling with emotion. You look absolutely stunning. I smiled, my own eyes welling up as I stepped forward to embrace her. The familiar scent of lavender and vanilla enveloped me, and for a moment, I was a little girl again, safe in the arms of the woman who had loved and nurtured me all my life. Thank you mother, I whispered, my voice thick with emotion. For everything. She pulled back cupping my face in her hands as she gazed at me with a mixture of pride and love. I'm so happy for you, my darling. Ben is a good man. I nodded, my heart swelling with love for the man who had captured my heart so completely. I'm the lucky one mother. He's everything I've ever dreamed of and more. As the ceremony drew near, my heart raced with anticipation. I took a deep breath, steadying my nerves as I prepared to walk down the aisle. With each step, I felt the weight of the momentous occasion, my eyes fixed on Ben waiting at the altar. He looked devastatingly handsome in his tailored suit, his chestnut hair gleaming in the warm glow of the candles. 
his piercing blue eyes locked with mine, and in that moment, there was only him, only us, and the love that had brought us together. The music swelled as I made my grand entrance, my mother by my side. It wasn't traditional for the bride to be escorted by her mother, but there was no one else I wanted with me in this moment. She had been my rock, my constant source of support and love, and I wanted to honor that bond as I took this next step in my life. Elena walked ahead of me as my maid of honor, her golden hair cascading down her back in soft waves. She looked radiant in a gown of pale blue, a bouquet of wildflowers clutched in her hands. She took her place at the altar and turned to me with a smile, her eyes shining with joy and love. As I walked towards Ben, a rush of emotion washed over me. The love and adoration shining in his gaze was almost too much to bear, and my heart swelled with a love so fierce, so all-consuming, that it threatened to overwhelm me. With each step, I felt the weight of our journey together, the trials and triumphs that had brought us to this moment. I thought of the first time we met, the spark of connection that had ignited between us, and the way that spark had grown into a flame that could not be extinguished. I thought of the moments of doubt and fear. I thought of the joy and laughter we had shared, the quiet moments of intimacy and tenderness that had become the foundation of our love. As I reached the altar Ben took my hand in his, his touch sending a shiver over my skin. His eyes were bright with unshed tears, and I could see the depth of his love and devotion reflected in them. Margaret, Ben began, his voice thick with emotion. From the moment I first saw you, I knew that my life would never be the same. You captivated me with your beauty, your grace, and your fierce independence. You challenged me to be a better man, to strive for something greater than myself. He paused, his eyes searching mine as he continued. I promise to love you with every fiber of my being, to cherish and support you through all of life's joys and sorrows. I promise to be your partner and your best friend. I promise to fight for you, to protect you, and to stand by your side no matter what challenges we may face. Tears streamed down my face as I listened to his words, my heart overflowing with love and gratitude. When it was my turn to speak, I took a deep breath, my voice trembling with emotion. Ben, I began, my eyes locked with his. You have shown me what it means to be seen and accepted for all that I am. You have been my rock, my sanctuary, and my guiding light through the darkest of times. I paused, my voice catching in my throat as I continued, I promise to love you with every beat of my heart, to stand by your side through every trial and triumph. I promise to be your partner, your confidant, and your greatest champion. I promise to cherish every moment we have together, to build a life filled with love, laughter, and endless adventures. With the exchange of rings, Ben and I sealed our vows with a kiss, the room erupting into cheers and applause as we were pronounced husband and wife. In that moment, I felt a profound sense of joy and contentment, knowing that I had found my happily ever after. As we turned to face our loved ones, hand in hand, gratitude washed over me. These were the people who had stood by us, who had believed in our love. They were the ones who had lifted us up, who had been our strength and our support through every challenge we had faced. I looked out at the sea of smiling faces, my heart swelling with emotion. There was my mother, her eyes brimming with tears of joy as she watched me embark on this new chapter of my life. There was Emily, my eldest sister, her face beaming with pride and love as she stood beside her own husband and children. Charlotte, my vivacious and adventurous sister, grinned from ear to ear, her eyes sparkling with mischief as she winked at me from across the room. And then there was Elena, my dearest friend and confidant, her face radiant with happiness as she stood by my side, just as she had always done. But it was the sight of Liam that nearly brought me to tears. He stood tall and proud, his piercing blue eyes so like his brother's, filled with a mixture of love and pride. I knew how much this moment meant to him, how much he longed for a large family. Perhaps one day he would find a woman to create that family with and they would have ten children and a house full of laughter and cookies. Ben and I made our way back down the aisle, hand in hand. The air was filled with the scent of roses and lilies, the delicate petals drifting through the air like confetti as we stepped out into the warm spring sunshine. Before the reception, Ben and I stole away for a few precious moments alone, basking in the glow of our newfound union. We found a quiet alcove in the gardens, the scent of jasmine and honeysuckle perfuming the air as we held each other close. I love you, Mrs. O'Malley, Ben whispered, his lips brushing against my ear as he spoke. The sound of my new name sent a thrill through me, a reminder of the sacred vows we had just exchanged. And I love you, Mr. O'Malley, I replied, my voice thick with emotion as I gazed up at him, my heart filled to bursting with love and joy. 
We shared tender kisses and whispered promises, savoring the intimacy of the moment amidst the whirlwind of the day. There would be challenges and obstacles ahead, but I also knew that with Ben by my side, I could face anything. Our love had been tested by fire, forged in the crucible of adversity, and it had emerged stronger and more resilient than ever before. We had fought for each other and now, as we stood on the threshold of a new life, I knew that there was nothing we couldn't overcome. Forever and always, Ben murmured, his forehead resting against mine as he gazed into my eyes, his love and devotion shining through. Forever and always, I echoed, my heart swelling with a love so fierce, so all-consuming, that I thought it might burn me up. This was just the beginning of our happily ever after. A lifetime of love stretched out before us, and I couldn't wait to see where it would take us. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your time in Harborview with Margaret and Benjamin and that you had a wonderful time experiencing their love story with them. I know I did as I wrote it. I enjoyed it so much. Next up will be, I think I'm going to do Elena's story. So Margaret's younger sister will get her in love and happy and with her happily ever after. And then I want to do Liam's, which will be a little bit different because it'll be from the guy's perspective because we're telling Liam's story. So stay tuned. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Please remember that you are so very loved and have a wonderful day.